Hello. Hello, Internet. I'm doing the voice. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome back to another wonderful day of Lightbox Expo online. Yes. Um, are we are we live, everybody? I'm, I'm looking at the chat. Uh, oop, I'm seeing hellos. Sounds good. Seems like ooh, we've got a good crowd. Um, welcome, you guys. Uh, great to see you. Uh, it's, a, it's a good mustache day. So I thought I'd turn my camera on at least briefly at the beginning <laughs> to celebrate. Um, uh, welcome. Uh, it's been an incredible weekend so far. Um, the uh, character design-a-thon yesterday was so intense. Um, but thank you guys. I bet a bunch of you uh, were there um, and uh, turned up for Claire Hummel and John Lauren. Um, and that was amazing, but we did nine hours of streaming. So I'm, I'm thinking that maybe today is going to be a little more low-key. <laughs> um, but uh, welcome uh, to the color workshop. Um, I think the, the idea today uh, is for us to sort of go um, nice and slowly through a couple of principles of color, um, talk about color in a way that, you know, there's a lot of resources out there um, for color work in general. Um, and I've always found that a lot of them seem to skew really towards the technical and the scientific. And that's just not how I work. <laughs> um, I, you know, like probably most of you kind of came through uh, uh, sort of more traditional art school and uh, fan art kind of online art channels. Um, and uh, let me just make sure I'm not seeing that the stream is live at the moment. So I'm just checking one more time to make sure. So if I'm talking <laughs> and it's all for nothing, that would be rough. Anyways, I came through these traditional sort of channels. It is live. Okay, Austin Marie, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Austin. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I really um, struggled a lot with color uh, to begin with and really, really needed to be taught. And I think that um, one of the things that I've been um, thinking about a lot in terms of the stuff I wanted to present at Lightbox and in general kind of pass on to the Internet, um, for a lot of us... Uh, art comes intuitively and naturally. Um, and those things are really hard to teach. And this talk is gonna verge on a couple of those things where it's like pretty tricky to, uh, to nail down the specifics. Um, but uh, there are also things that, you know, moments where a little light bulb turns on and uh, usually that is the result of, uh, of learning, you know, having, having learned. Um, and uh, for me, going through art school, you know, I came in and I really struggled with color. Um, I, I drew exclusively in black and white. I, I had a really uh, serious kind of uh, traditional Western comics, kind of superhero comics background uh, when I started this this journey out. Um, well, audio's a bit low. Let me turn that. Is it? Let's see. Maybe if I move the mic. Um, uh, so... I really had a long journey ahead of me when I started out. Uh, this would have been in <laughs> about 2005. Um, and uh, a couple key lessons and, and ways of thinking about color kind of hit me uh, throughout my, my journey from that point. So I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about some of that stuff. Uh, my last caveat before we get into it, um, I, I really uh, can only speak from my own experience and color and a lot of this stuff throughout the weekend really gets into intensely subjective territory. Um, there's You're going to be hearing stuff uh, from a lot of people, and I'm sure you have already, that sounds like this is the way it, it must be. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think I can only say this is the way that I know how to do it and the way that I approach it. Um, what's great uh, is that uh, today we have Max Yelichny, uh as a guest. Um, and uh, I think, we, oh, wait, let me unmute you there. Are you on? Oh. We have Max. I am here. Yeah, um, and he's generously uh, agreed to join us and kind of offer his own perspective uh, on uh, color in his work. And um, so, first, I'm going to go through some basic principles, um, and then Max and I are both going to sort of split screen, do some draw overs. We've uh, you know, asked for submissions on on Twitter uh, and uh, culled together a bunch of, of options to paint over, and hopefully, uh, we'll have some good 
you know, discussion back and forth and uh, be able to, to teach from some of those examples live. Um, but uh, tell us about the color red. <laughs> uh, Max will be exclusively covering the entire uh, red end of the spectrum. <laughs> All of my comments, it doesn't <laughs> Perfect. Um, yeah, Max, actually, if you would just uh, you want to tell people a little bit about yourself and your background before we get into it, that'd be awesome. Yeah, uh, I, I start um, on my character currently, um, uh, as I call it. Uh, uh, mm. I spent time in Rex. Uh, I had a whole I left. G. G. Uh, comes from CG Lighter. Ooh. Oh, Max, can I pause you for a second there? It seems like the audio uh, is breaking up uh, pretty rough. Uh, and I'm just seeing a ton of, in the chat <laughs> of people just saying yeah. they can't hear you quite clearly. Is there a different microphone we could? Sorry. Uh, Sorry, everybody. Um, it's not taking up too much of my stream. I think it's still kind of a little bit crackly. Uh I think it's like a mic problem on your end for the, the time being. I think, uh, am I coming through clear, everybody? Um, no worries, guys. Sorry about the troubleshooting. <laughs> Just a bunch of artists trying to figure this out <laughs> on the fly a little bit here. But I uh, want to make sure you hear Max's good words as clearly as possible. Um, well, Max is trouble troubleshooting that. What's up? I think that's probably clearer. It might still be a little soft, but I think... Guys, tell us, uh, is this is Max's voice coming through better? Max, you should uh, yeah, test. I'm gonna try. Uh, can't hear, can't hear. No sound. Can you hear me now? Uh, I can hear you. I don't know if the chat can hear you. I'm getting a lot of... Uh, Oh, uh, some yes. Yes, picking him up. He's very low, very quiet. Um, so whatever's uh, picking you up is picking you up much clearer, but maybe if you're... Uh, that could be... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it might just be nearness to the mic if, if there's a, a mic in question. I'm sorry about that. Let me see if I can turn you up on my end. Oh, wait, wait, wait. What if the... What about this? Let me try. How about this? Give me some test. Max. Oh. Can you hear me? Uh, I, again, I can hear you. It's pretty soft, but uh, if you keep uh, keep testing it out for the chat. Testing, testing. I can't hear anything from you if you're speaking right now, dude. Um, Better. Uh, it's good, but it's. I think it's still quiet. I have turned you up. Sorry, guys. This is tricky. I've got all the way up. I think whatever you had uh, just previous to this might have been a little bit better. Not the first thing, but the second thing. <laughs> oh, troubleshooting. Almost. So close, people say. It's better. It's better than before, but it's... Uh, we're definitely getting a clearer uh, feed, so that's good. I'm, I'm trying all my different mics in my computer. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds okay. This is... Okay. Should I leave it here? Tolerable? <laughs> I can hear you now, they say. Um, it's definitely tolerable. I think it's a little quiet. Um, but I'll try and... Maybe I'll be a little bit quieter maybe i'll move away from the mic <laughs> and then people can adjust their volume so they can pick us both up they say workable can you tell if this is i cannot it's still super quiet i don't know okay <laughs> It's okay. 
Uh, I'm going to sort of start in on talking about some color principle stuff, and then we'll just kind of test sound throughout um, since we uh, will really be getting into it with the, the paint over stuff anyways. Um, okay, so um, what I wanted to talk about primarily um, right off the bat is a ways of thinking about color. Um, primarily that, you know, I think there's a big misconception that color is just about this space here, um, kind of taking a look at the uh, absolute, you know, endless possible display spectrum of color in your Photoshop or your Procreate. Um, and uh, I find that um, that's like probably the most intimidating part of being an artist and working in any kind of color is uh, the medium. I mean, you essentially have uh, your program is offering you like, which, which, Color in the visual spectrum would you like to paint in today, Mr. Cole? Um, and essentially, it's, it's, it's incredibly intimidating. And I think for a lot of people starting out, um, it can be uh, pretty brutal. Um, the uh, way that I, I began, uh, I had a, a strong desire to be using color a lot more in my work. But I was so scared of it. And I, I, I know from speaking with students in the years since that uh, that's a pretty common experience for a lot of people. Um, a lot of folks, uh, have, uh, a fear, but a desire, you know, sort of a mix of, of, uh, wanting to do something, but just not having, uh, the capability yet to sort of see what they're doing or control what they're doing. And for me, the issue was control. Um, and that was, uh, you know, sort of one of the big lessons, uh, early on. So, uh, as I started to sort of grapple with it, you know, the earliest kind of thing I understood was the principle of black and white contrast, which essentially we call value. Um, and um, that is sort of the one of the first building blocks of, of composition, of drawing, of kind of the, the way that uh, we come to the work that we do. We have a, a line or a space without a line, and that's pretty much it. You know, you can throw down the charcoal, you can leave an empty space or erase a white space. And uh, that's a principle that pretty much everybody can understand really clearly. Um, one of the things uh, I didn't have a, a clear handle on was kind of things kind of along this spectrum, which is to say not just dark to light, but saturated to desaturated. Um, so uh, that would be my second kind of principle to you, especially when we're talking about color, would be to talk about saturation versus desaturation. Now, as I talk about this, the the whole concept is that color is communicative. The work that we do as designers and illustrators is essentially a kind of storytelling. Um, we are attempting to draw the eye, to sort of focus someone's attention, to, to pull what a, a viewer is seeing uh, into focus uh, in the work that we're doing. And uh, the language of that communication is contrast. And so these different types of contrast um, are ways that we help to bring attention to the places in a, in a given design, like a single character. But also, and I think we'll probably talk a lot about this since a lot of the submissions were uh, illustration pieces of work, in the scope of balancing the composition of a whole piece. Um, one of the biggest revelations for me, and this is not a perfect sort of uh, visual, I find anyways, was color contrast across the uh, color kind of spectrum, a uh, complementary color contrast. What we mean by complementary colors, again, going really basic here, but uh, colors that sit kind of on the opposite ends of the color wheel. The classic one is blue-orange. Um, and uh, you'll find that blue orange exists across all concept art as one of the you know primary ways that people use color to get your attention. Um, that's uh, we've just created Finding Nemo right there essentially. Boom, that is the principle of contrast working. You know you have your giant blue world, your orange protagonist, and who's your secondary character? <laughs> Dory, who's blue and fading into the background. So it's a principle of design there that they're using um, in Finding Nemo to use color to draw your attention. Uh, another 
uh, pair that you see a lot um, is kind of purple with yellow, also sitting on the opposite end of the, the color spectrum there, and red green, which Max is a master of. Uh, <laughs> uh, Max's feed is wigging out completely. <laughs> Sorry, Max. Oh, no. I'm seeing cursors and, and strobing. It's oh, incredible. No. Oh. Um, I'm trying to get on my bag. My Photoshop is just being a real. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> what, 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 I can't even see what I'm. <laughs> if you check out wow. Twitch, it's pretty spectacular. It's kind of like a firework of cursors. Um, wow. Interesting. I'm sorry. Let me see if I can that. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay. I'm gonna keep an eye on the on the call, but for now I'm gonna take the video feed out of the uh, totally uh, stream fine. so that yeah. there's oh. no <laughs> strobing yeah. happening in the side yeah. there. Okay, so back to color contrast. Um, complementary color contrast is <laughs> so, so funny. Um, complementary color contrast is a huge principle. Um, that we often use. For me, this was a massive light bulb. It's so simple. It's almost stupid simple. It's one of the things that um, I don't know why I didn't get, but just the exact same way that black to white uh, contrast works, uh, colors across that color wheel create a friction. Uh, you'll see it, especially when I crank up the saturation to levels like this. It's like hard to look at when you're really doing like pure red against pure green. There's kind of a vibration on the screen, almost like a, uh, a buzz in the pixels where the two colors of the highest possible contrast meet. Um, so uh, we'll call this complementary contrast. Um, there's a couple other different principles of contrast that are going to come into play as we sort of just look at things in general here. I'm just going to pick a relatively neutral color. Um, sort of soft uh, versus hard. Uh, that'll be uh, edge contrast. Things that are out of focus versus things that are in, in sharp focus, but even in design uh, using uh, th those principles, uh, you can create uh, a, a tension within the design. Um, and then uh, one that I've been talking about a lot recently, uh, more than I, I had previously, is busyness versus simplicity. Um, those are, uh, you know, patterns that we use, uh, a lot of detail, the, the sort of rich, uh, condensed detail that you see in a lot of uh, AAA kind of high-end character design. Um, when you create a space visually that is predominated by detail, um, simplicity can be uh, a uh, sudden break that you can't look away from. You can only be held sort of staring at the moment of simplicity. Um, often you see the opposite. So you create a wide open sky and something detailed and complicated comes out of it. And that's where the focal point is locked. Um, so we'll just say simplicity. Uh, and really, honestly, these are these are the the principles of co of contrast uh, that I think I'm gonna talk about. Oh, it's probably <laughs> you're right. I spelled it wrong. You're totally right. Complementary. I'm an artist. I'm not really a you know speller. <laughs> um, you're totally correct. But the principles stand. We've got value, saturation, complementary colors edge control and complexity versus simplicity. Um, I've seen the question uh, coming up a bunch of times. Yes, this is a uh, VOD is going to be saved to my Twitch channel for the next 14 days after this. Um, and if it goes well, <laughs> uh, I'll probably export it and pop it up on YouTube later. Uh, so keep uh, an eye on that. Um, so really just keeping these, I'm going to try and keep these sort of tucked up in the corner so we can reference them. And I'm going to erase D from saturation because that's silly. And I'm going to complete the N because I, I can spell. I just choose not to. Um, and I want to just kind of walk through a couple examples because I think, uh, you know, it's always, since we're all visual people, it's often much easier to work with some examples in front of you. Um, so the, you know, 
simplicity versus complexity, right? The ocean of Finding Nemo is often an extremely simple canvas. And then the complexity of the single detail of the characters that your eyes are going to be locked into. It's a perfect example. But also we're seeing blue to orange uh, complementary color contrasts at work there. Um, the opposite is true as well. You see this a ton in Ghibli movies where... Uh, the backgrounds are rich and super, super complicated. And they're using that um, contrast with the, the extreme simplicity of the cell shading of the character designs to pop that forward and lock your attention in. And of course, this is all happening simultaneously with color contrast as well. So they've essentially created a field of sort of uh, lime greens and yellows um, and the... Uh, white and the sort of powder kind of um it's a kind of a soft gray blue in sophie's uh shirt kind of pop against that because they're just the only instances of of uh that level of of um brightness essentially mostly this is a functioning on the basis of both brightness and complexity versus simplicity um so you've got both of those things working for you and they're always coming together all at once um there's never, you know, rarely are you looking at just one type of contrast. You're often looking at a bunch of different types. But they're all working together to try and draw your attention uh, to a single point on the screen. Um, one example uh, from my own work and experience is Spyro. Um, so originally, um, Spyro, I'll uh, expand my screen a little larger so you guys can see more clearly um, for the time being. Um, so, originally, Spyro uh, the dragon was meant to be a little green dragon, um, but it was very immediately clear uh, that when the levels were covered in green grass, uh, it was almost impossible to pick him out uh, and track him wherever he was going. Um, for the protagonist of your game, that's a really big problem. Just like Finding Nemo, essentially, if you're setting a, a, a movie in the ocean and everything's going to be some shade of blue at some point, Orange, the complementary color, is going to be the best possible way to uh, pull that uh, attention. So the decision was made to convert Spyro to purple. Uh, it was a more unusual color for a dragon, but it was really just because of the color contrast that they made that decision. And in doing that, they made him much more iconic. Uh, you've seen green dragons all over the place. It's a classic thing from like Pete's Dragon and way back. But purple was uh, actually a relatively new idea. And just based on the fact that they had a color puzzle to solve, uh, an icon, you know, was essentially born. Um, it's also why the early Crash Bandicoot games shy completely away from lava levels. Um, because he's orange and lava's orange. And so they did a lot uh, trying to make sure that he was popping and, and keeping you locked on the screen. But purple... Uh, and green are not exact color complements. Um, it's more purple and yellow. Um, with green, the color complement is red. And what I think is also interesting and fun about Spyro is that the gems that you're collecting are that pop of bright sort of classic red on the field of green. Um, so in terms of you know attention, you're looking at your main character, but you're actually spending the game hunting for these objects tucked away in the background. Um, so the gameplay function and the color kind of mesh into one thing at that point. Uh, so that's a little fun fact about Spyro. So for me, the um, during school, one of the, the things, the light bulbs that went off was looking at the work of a guy named Hans Bacher. Uh, Hans Bacher uh, works or worked for, I don't know where he is these days, for uh, Disney. Um, and uh, these paintings are all uh, from the visual development of Mulan. Um, unbelievable work. And uh, the book that he... Uh, let me just pull out a, a little pencil so that you guys can see. Uh, it's called Dream Worlds by Hans Bacher. And I really recommend getting it if you are in the, mo uh, in the market for a good art book. Dream Worlds by Hans Bacher. Um, it introduced me, and I think uh, hopefully something that you guys are going to be able to see as we look through these, 
um, to the idea that uh, you didn't have to brute force your way through color. Um, you don't have to throw an endless stream of intensely high saturated color at a piece in order to make it function for you. Essentially, pieces like this, you know, they function based on a really limited palette with slight fluctuations in value. And the color contrast of, of cool to warm is at play, but also dark to light. So you have these beautiful sort of light birds. Once they move over into contrast on the white space, they pop over into a dark silhouette, which is just a lovely decision that sort of draws attention to them. Um, but the thing that I find I can't look away from in this piece is the lantern. And relatively, it's not even like a very hot kind of yellow. You know, it's not something that, um, you know, uh, you might think of when you think of pulling a, a yellow crayon out of the box. Um, but even this really pale, desaturated kind of green yellow in this space is such a contrast to these colors and the value uh, of the, the dark blue that it's set against that you create a focal point that just holds your attention and won't let it go. Um, likewise, I mean, it's all throughout his work. There's something so gorgeous about this because you're operating in neutral. So if you look at where this is falling, uh, you're seeing just grays that exist somewhere far to the left of this, uh, the, um, saturation spectrum, right? A bunch of neutrals, but relative to the surroundings and to this, um, kind of strange kind of, uh, soft lemon color. Uh, there's a green quality to the um, the neutrals you're seeing. This the lemon comes from somewhere further into yellow, and these neutrals up here tend to go further into green. Right, you're creating this field of perceived green. It's so subtle, um, but just by creating an impression uh, like that, this red becomes just the most unbelievable and that red is, is way low down you know there's not a lot of heat in that red if you really wanted to crank that up you know <laughs> you could and and you would never be able to look away uh from a focal point like that so that single pop of red in a field of cool neutrals um the one thing i want to come back to and this is just a stupid mantra that i have returned to a lot recently is set the table serve the meal one color, uh, the sort of beginning par part of the process, is all about setting the table, creating this field of greeny, kind of warm neutrals. Serving the meal right in the middle of this beautifully set table, right onto the tablecloth, right onto this big white plate you've created. There's your area of focus. Um, that's it. I mean, honestly, if you, if you learn nothing else from this stream and, and if you go away with nothing else, I think that um, color is so subjective there are no bad colors, literally like all color is so valid. And when I called out for uh, examples uh, of people's work, I was shocked by some of the stuff people thought that they needed to fix because there was no issue there. Uh, color, to me anyways, the, the way into color is through its function. The way into understanding how to do really great color that catches people's eyes, that sticks in their memory, um, that really um, holds their attention in a way that, um, affects their emotions even, you know, to really get into the psychology of it is to draw their attention with it. And that's pure function. And function is, you know, a, a, a result of contrast here. Um, this is barely even color. I mean, you're looking at essentially one color, you know, you're looking at blue going from a sort of more, um, something a little bit deeper to something uh, a little bit greener, something deeper into, I mean, sort of the purple blue spectrum towards a greenier uh, blue. <laughs> You'll find also, I'm not big on color names. Like I don't know what the names of the paint tubes are. So Cerulean maybe. Um, uh, there are a few, I'm a huge fan of Prussian blue. And so this looks like Prussian blue to me, but <laughs> I don't know if that's the technical term for it all. Um, but even with, you know, you have uh, only one instance of, of extreme contrast here. Uh, and it's actually super subtle. So if you were to look just at the value difference between this black and this blue, it's, it's not crazy wide. It's not as wide as if you were to put these black rocks right here on the white. If you were to put 
the same black structure right there on the white and the composition, suddenly that would become the subject of the painting, right? But because you've reduced the contrast, set the table with a darker blue here, you can serve this little black up as like an hors d'oeuvre, right? A little side dish. Um, and you create this beautiful dark shape all up here in the foreground and right nestled in there, not even super hot, you know, you've got your little army uh, of people traveling. And because he's created such a beautiful space of simplicity, the sudden low contrast complexity of that little group of people is the focal point. Um, super, super great. Um, and they have a, a little bit of a, of a color contrast aspect to them as well. They move uh, a little bit more towards green uh, in the light as it, it warms up just a little bit within that cool space. Another instance of, of uh, just value contrast primarily. The reason that this color doesn't pull is because it's uh, so faint and so desaturated. It's uh, relative to the blues, it's warmed up a lot. So you do notice the warm yellow kind of dawn light kind of coming into the sky. But it's such a subtle shift that it doesn't pull the focus away. Um, and even here, you'd think, you know, the area of, of contrast between the reeds and the hill is really intense. And it does pull focus, but because he's such a master of composition, he's drawn your eye down through the reeds just into the area where this rider catches your attention. So you almost notice the reed first and then the rider in the middle of it. Um, but because of the way he's composed it, it's, it's very hard to look away. Um, so these are just gorgeous paintings, period. I would actually like love to hang any of these in a space that I was occupying. Um, I, you know, I just think they're, they're beautiful works, uh, and it's not something that somebody had to uh, spend days and hours sort of grinding at to get just right and balance well. Uh, it's something that with the right mentality, uh, just the elegant composition, control of value, light to dark contrast, and color contrast, um, you've got my attention completely. This is also from Hans's book. <coughs> Just to nail down like the way that that light dark contrast is working under the surface. A lot of examples um, that people send over uh, with uh, uh, asking for advice in color actually uh, wind up being pieces that need to be um, adjusted in terms of their value, uh, black and white contrast. Um, and composition, that would be a whole other talk about uh, how to lay out an image in a way to draw your eye just with black to white. Um, but it's also a principle of color, you know, the darker the color, uh, as you desaturate it, as you move it away from its complementary pair versus moving it towards the complementary contrast, towards brightness, towards saturation. If you get all three of those going at the same time, yeah, you've got a, a rock solid focal point. All right. It's my big fanboy moment. The Prince of Egypt. I'm going to drop this link in the chat. I've been, when I was prepping for this talk, uh, I went and looked through uh, my Prince of Egypt art book. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, Light and Dark will be value. That's correct. Uh, the Prince of Egypt is an incredible film. Um, not the least because it is just beautifully told story-wise. Um, but visually, it's a feast. And it's, a, it's such a tightly controlled... Um, example of beautiful, thoughtful color in the tradition of uh, things like Hans, uh, artists like Hans Bacher, who may in fact have been on this. I, I'm not even sure of that. Um, you're creating, you know, cool spaces with neutrals. This sort of sandstone spectrum here is so like there's there's very little difference between these colors. They all kind of exist within a bit of a green space within the spectrum as they start to head towards the focal point uh they lighten up uh they become it's funny actually what you're looking at is warm to cool contrast and there's a warmth in the shadows here uh and a coolness of the kind of yellow they're using it's kind of quite close to green any any further and you'd be reading it as a green um i read it as a yellow i don't, I don't know if you do as well but what's interesting to, uh, on this one is that uh, the focal point itself, it's just indicated by this giant V. It's a big kind of V shape pointing you directly at where they're going to 
put the character. They're setting the table. It's a bit of a flourish here, you know? And then, boom, you're staring at Ramses as he sort of enters the scene and, and becomes the focus of the piece. What I love about this is that the contrast is so high on Moses, right? You've just got uh, a table that's set just in these beautiful, neutral, warm tones. They range cool to warm. There's all kinds of variation, but they're so neutral that they blend together. And by neutral, I mean we're moving further towards desaturation. So if you're in a situation in a piece where you're not sure how to create a cohesive uh, world of color, um, I would recommend trying to desaturate some stuff. First, begin with desaturation. As you desaturate, colors tend to blend a little bit more easily. And as you saturate it, they start to create that friction with each other. So the desaturation here allows you to include stuff that just goes all the way across the spectrum. You've got blues and purples and greens and oranges, but they're all relatively low saturation until you hit Moses and his skin is just so, it's not only uh, dark, but it's further down the saturation uh, line as well. Uh, the hair, of course, really holds that contrast the highest, but you also need it up there because the, um, the contrast of the shadows here is lower than it would be here. If you put his uh, hair down here, you'd have an even more intense contrast. But you've got a secondary focal point as well. Um, so what you did here by creating this warm space, what they've done over here is create kind of a, a cool space, also pretty neutral. And as you go further up this arch, that's becoming warmer and warmer and more and more blended. The difference in value uh, is, is uh, less and less intense between these colors up here. But they're, they're slowly setting the table with something that gets brighter and cooler right before a dark, warm shape of Ramses breaks that space. And there you have a secondary focal point. And then the contrast on the secondary focal point here is lower between Ramses and uh, you know the sort of space around him uh, than it is with Moses here with his saturation and the darkness of his skin. Um, you're creating a hierarchy. You're identifying you know foreground from background, the observer from the observed. So you're not actually like locked in narratively with Ramses at this point. You're really with Moses because that's the focal point of the illustration. Um, I can't think of a better example of like purple to yellow uh, complementary color contrast than this. And what I love about this is something that I try to do a lot in my own work, which is as you set the table, you know, your, your coolest colors begin to build up towards it. You know, there's a little bit of preparing, you know, for this orange. Um, and it's a really tame orange, you know what I mean? It's, we're not talking something wild here. Uh, it, uh, verging on yellow, you know, only verging because it's, it's so uh, bright, but it's, it's definitely, it's, it's a pink technically. Um, but relative to the, the sort of blues and, um, and purples here, it reads as, as a lot warmer, uh, but it's actually quite cool. But you're in this early morning space um, and you're creating a, a framing set of values and colors. And this is, you know, this beautiful warm light kind of directs you. It's kind of a, a visual arrow pointing you towards the point of focus. And this would be right here because the contrast of color is so high. If you took away the center focal point, that would be the center of attention over there to the left. But because the contrast here is lower uh, in terms of value, this is going to pop way higher. Um, oh, sorry, I'm seeing some questions in the chat. I'm sorry. I, uh, what drill do I do to develop observational skill to simplify shadow, uh, especially for animation? The torso is pretty hard. Now, that's a complicated question. I'm not sure I understand it entirely. Uh, but it, in terms of uh, drilling your observational skills to sort of see these contrasts in re uh, real life. Um, I'm going to get to that, actually. I have a specific little slide prepared for how to drill this in real life. But I just want to walk through some, some pretty simple examples um, that will help us all to get on the same page of what we're looking for and what we're observing. Um, uh, it does mean that the pyramids in this piece, yes, they are a second focal point. 
Um, there's a question. Uh, you find yourself able to recognize these principles in others' work. Do you have a hard time knowing how to make these choices in your own work? Do I have any tips? Again, yes, I do. <laughs> I have some tips on that one. Um, but I think that there's a, a, there has to be a melding of the two. You're seeing those things that work in other people's work. You can see it in Prince of Egypt because the work's already done. And in your own work, it's hard because you don't know how to set up the color contrast and create that space. So we'll get to that. We'll definitely get to that. I mean, here you go. I mean, once again, you've created a, a, a bright, cool space. You've set the table for Moses here. Even though the subject of this painting really is like the the explosion of the sea parting um and yet the 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 focal point um well one a sec it's kind of a secondary focal point but the color contrast is really um locking you in on moses you're really only seeing a, a warm red contrasting against this blue right there and that's essentially the spiro principle at work right if you're going to put him against blue make him warm and red um verging on orange uh like a rusty red to, to contrast with that and the rest of what you're seeing here is all just value you know it's all just darker blue to lighter blue and that's what's creating that and really the emphasis of centering it uh overwhelming the composition with it makes it a focal point if moses was bigger in this frame it would be hard to be awed by the the magic of what's happening in front of you um so definitely recommend checking out these things last thing i mean this this frame i, I couldn't find anything that wasn't this blurry but it almost works in our favor right because we it simplifies everything down to just uh a couple colors but uh We've got this this strange kind of lemon yellow that they use, and I think it's probably because it's one of the colors that gouache comes regularly in, and a lot of this was created very traditionally in gouache. But in setting the table for this, we've created a dark sort of space of silhouettes here with the basket. But the basket and the, uh, the, the queen encountering the basket with Moses here are a secondary focal point. The primary focal point is Moses' sister here uh, observing. She's, you know, what we're, we're seeing is, you know, overwhelmingly the composition is uh, Moses in the basket. But because the contrast is so low between these colors, uh, we really look to see Miriam back here as she breaks the silhouette. And uh, you watch the color go from cool to warmer and warmer and warmer as it approaches her where finally she pops but there's kind of this gravity of all the color kind of drawing you down um into uh into the focal point of the image anyways i just love this movie i think it's great highly teachable kind of visuals um uh, funnily enough a piece i love that i was looking at as i was looking through uh all of this stuff um, is this, and what's interesting is that, you know, the highest point of both value and color contrast is here, oops, here, down with the crowd, right? Um, you create this black space, some of the lightest lights, period, just value-wise, you know, in terms of the piece, they're right here at the edge. And then the highest color contrast between orange and blue is happening with all the fire here and yet because you create essentially a line of orange there's not a single focal point if we eliminated most of that orange you'd have a, a more intense single focal point um, it would still work though because of the way it's set up in terms of the comp composition but what I wanted to point out about this one is that the <laughs> calling attention to something is not the only tool we have in terms of using contrast and color. It's also hiding something and letting you discover it. Um, what they're doing here essentially is hiding the whale and just by a subtle shift in value, introducing with the underlighting and the dark shadow, uh, the presence of the whale behind the sheet of water, right? And, uh, there's a reaction, at least I felt in the theater and, and you can remember this shot of awe, you know, because with the people that you're identifying with down here, because of the way the composition and the color are directing your eye, you're observing this event along with them, through them and behind them. Um, 
so there is a feeling of something emerging um and uh it is the focal point becomes the focal point because you're looking through their eyes at it um because it's centered because uh yeah they've pushed the other stuff in the composition so far down um and uh and yet it it's hiding in plain sight right um uh, same principle is working uh, in this N.C. Wyeth painting that I love. So here, once again, you have uh, the highest point of color contrast, cool to warm, on this kid's bathing suit, and also these, like, yellows here, and high contrast between, like, the dark of this kid's shorts and the light of his shirt and their skin and this hat and her hair. You're having, you know, so much color contrast information down here. And yet, because they've oops, forced, because Wyeth has forced the composition into such an extreme centered kind of uh, situation, you're noticing with them this, you're discovering coming out of the clouds. You know, from a distance, you wouldn't see this. You know, from across the room in a gallery, you wouldn't know what you were looking at quite. You know, you would notice the children first. And the moment you come close enough to it, suddenly, boom. Um, this, uh, the giant walking through the clouds reveals itself. And the discovery, the moment of discovery you get to participate uh, in along with the children because of their playing with contrast there uh, is wonderful. And it makes this piece the sort of thing that you would want to, to hang in your own home. Um, so uh, enough about that, but also not enough, never enough about N.C. Wyeth. I am just a huge fan of N.C. Wyeth. And I think, again, just another example of working smarter not harder not throwing so much detail and brute force at a composition to make it work um but thinking about principles of contrast composition and color to uh hold your eye so this is again the really blurry one but essentially this image is you know black and white you know you've got really low contrast on the tree right here you know you've just got the sort of modeling of of snow and that sort of thing happening through the branches its contrast frames perfectly a dark spot for this this character's white snow to pop from. So once again, he's set the table and served the meal, but you never get a green uh, as green as his hat anywhere else in the painting. Uh, this color, this guy goes into blues, but none of them are quite as saturated or you know uh, as this green, and it's such a subtle difference. Like it's a very simple shift over um but that green is is unique and it creates a, a focal pop otherwise this piece sort of exists entirely based on value contrast again i this is my favorite wyeth painting i think it's so good this is another one where the point of it is to sort of hide something in plain sight so you're creating um dark cool spaces a bright place setting with the clouds here suddenly you know the only place where you're, you're you're creating this white this kind of cream color the sky's blue you know like it doesn't occupy much of the painting at all it's obscured by trees everywhere except where it wants to begin to lead you in to the focal point of the piece and then you get this the warmth of their skin against they're blending in their costumes hide them in the same colors as the leaves and trees but the uh, pop the pop of warmth of their skin right here draws your eye uh, suddenly to that spot. Um, so that is that. And then just to, to be sure, we're not talking just about traditional painting. We're not talking about stuff that can only apply to certain styles of artwork. Um, Mike Mignola is a master of storytelling through composition and contrast. And the color... Um, that the colorists that work on his books bring to it um, is just unbelievable. So again, you have the Spyro principle at work here, right? You've got a character who is, oops, just the nature of Hellboy is that he is bright red. Um, he is just a bright red focal pop no matter what. And he is uh, framed in this page against green. And when he appears in the frame, you can't look away. Um, the value is also like much lower uh, in the areas where Mike doesn't want you to look. Uh, here is a perfect example of that. So you've got, once again, cool to warm contrast where even between black and white, you know, uh, he's still creating all these, there's, there's all these beautiful neutral colors. 
further down that saturation spectrum into desaturated so that right in the middle of it, even light on light, you know, like this, this red versus this blue, they're both pretty high up there, you know, up uh, in the sort of color picker. They're closer to brightness, but the color contrast between cool and warm and red and blue there has that friction. So there's just no way that Hellboy isn't the focal point of the whole piece. And another thing that I do a lot that you'll see in a lot of video games, especially video games like League of Legends, where you create a green space, right? The map is green and cool. You're looking down on it at characters. Uh, you're primarily looking at their heads, you know? That's where you want to make sure immediately, I see their heads, I see them moving, I see them attacking. So Hellboy's, uh, the red of, of his head, the focal point closest to the center of the composition is much more saturated than the red further down. It's a simple gradient, um, but the, the drive uh, to focus up to that point uh, right in the center uh, has a lot of gravity to it. And you'll see that in a lot of video game character designs where the head carries a lot more saturation, brightness, and contrast. And then further down, away from that focal point, you're losing that contrast and you're losing the character. I love this. This is definitely based off of a Wyeth painting of pirates. <laughs> if you look it up, uh, Wyeth pirates, you'll find it in the Google Images search. I forgot to include it in this uh, little presentation, but um, basically, you you know, once again, you're creating this light dark space. And what I love is just right between the the cool neutral shapes, uh, or rather colors, of his coat. And what I love about this, his coat has like three colors so it's not all about blending and creating gradients everywhere um but the red is really desaturated on hellboy so that it it has a, a kinship with the grays of the coat uh it's not so high contrast that it's popping everywhere because what they want you to look at is the the wound in hellboy's chest um so good um Everything here kind of builds towards setting the table for that pop of red. And then that red relates to the title. And you've got mm, just a mm, beautiful composition that hangs on color. So, whew, that was a lot. That almost took the full hour. <laughs> so sorry. That is uh, a lot. There's a lot of people still here. So I am grateful for your attention. Um, those are the some of the big light bulb moments honestly for me is just setting the table serving the meal um in terms of exercises somebody asked about traditional exercises to increase your observational power um to so sort of be looking for it uh and if max is still around i need to check in on max and make sure he's okay um I yeah mm -hmm. i can hear you uh, I oh no i have a stupid squats joke right here here we go here's your exercise um, <laughs> well, my recommendation, uh, is to limit your palate. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the way that I learned, I started with black and white and learned about composition. I started to add extremely limited kind of gated, um, uh, shades of color in there. And I worked traditionally. I mean, one of the things that I really loved about, um, my, uh, experience at art school was that I was actually forced and I never would wanted to uh, would have wanted to do this on my own but they they led me to oil paint to gouache to watercolor and just mixing colors from a limited set of paints so I was told for uh, the better part of a semester you have ultramarine blue you have burnt sienna and you have yellow ochre and white those are the three colors and those are what you're painting from Nick because <laughs> they had identified I had kind of a color issue that I needed to work on. And it's quite a drab palette. It's a very traditional fine art drab, uh, those three colors. So what you're looking at there is essentially um, the burnt sienna was probably somewhere in here. Uh, ultramarine blue. I mean, you're, got, you're, you're pretty deep into like here, maybe a little more chroma on that. Um, and then yellow ochre. And for the better part of a semester, I just mixed everything for the paintings that I was doing from life, um, from these three colors plus white. Um, 
uh, and it was a hugely educational experience because with a limited palette, you can be learning all the principles of contrast and composition. You know, within this, there is a movement of cool to warm, right? You're able to mix colors that go from like, you know, if you mix white with the blue, you're getting stuff that's kind of in this zone, right? All across the spectrum. You can still pop something. You mix, you mix your orange with these two. And you can still create kind of a muddy Finding Nemo color contrast there. Cool to warm. Um, so it's still 100% possible to work that way. Uh, and essentially what I had been doing, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, is this cartoon. It's a, you know, lesser known Japanese cartoon. You may be familiar with it. Uh, character of Rock Lee fights with weights on, suddenly has a dramatic moment where he takes the weights off of his legs and he's like, I've been handicapped the entire time. Like, now I kick your ass. Um, he sort of willfully uh, gives himself uh, a hurdle um, so that he trains himself to be even stronger. So once you take those weights off of you, you're going to be so much stronger. So if you limit your palette just to practice um, color contrast, creating, you know, setting the table, serving the meal, setting the table, serving the meal, trying different pairs, do a lot of red, green, do a lot of orange, blue, do a lot of purple, yellow, and then begin to introduce other colors into that palette. Uh, that would be uh, probably the... <laughs> I, I, I am not left-handed. That's perfect. That's exactly it. Um, uh, I really, really, really would recommend uh, doing exercises to limit the palette. Digitally speaking, uh, you can do that. And I think that you can download palettes, uh, color pick from palettes, um, and commit to... I'm just going to use the colors that I can sort of get within a, a literally downloaded limited palette uh, of options. And practice in that, you know, just do studies from life. Try and get as much juice as you can from something limited. And that way, when you start to build and add, like, okay, now I want to add my, you know, kind of greenier Prussian blue that I love so very, very much. Um, you know, and then, I, you know, something further down the spectrum here. And now I'm going to get, you know, a tube of something like a cad red and get real max. See, I can't, I can't even come up to it. I'm so, I'm so scared of reds. Uh, heck yeah. The whole oh boobs series of and it's all about oh heck about like kind of non non primary and mixer palettes uh, primary is an unusual like three colors. oh so good oh great relevant. Oh, uh, okay. Well, not in your it's right. Anybody wants to go deep. That's great. I mean, James Gurney is the guy for this. Um, in terms of, you know, if you want to do deeper, more, uh, intensive study, you know, my hope was to sort of break it down to like really simple stuff. Um, but if you, you know, want a true master, <laughs> James Gurney's your dude. Um, his book Color and Light has been like the standard, right, for for the longest time. Definitely. Uh, so we still got quiet, quiet Max uh, coming through, but I think we're gonna try and make it work anyways. Um, Should I just yeah? Are we okay when I do this? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I, I, Max, if you're down, I mean, let's uh, let's split this screen again and start doing some paint over stuff. And I'd love to hear actually just from you for a little bit. People could turn up their volume, and I'll shut up. Um, I'm so this stuff. <laughs> it's a it's an educational experience, like live on stream to figure out how to stream. But um, yeah. yeah, let me. I'll, I'll throw if you want to share your screen with me in Discord, and then I'll throw you up there. But I'm using my camera instead of my. Screen. Okay, cool. Let me see. Right now, I'm not seeing. Oh, red is the <laughs> red is red is best. Fight me. That's the one? All right. Is that the screen I'm looking at? Okay. I'm going to put that up right now. Nope. That's the wrong window. Now. There we go. Red is best. <laughs> All right. So, Max, I'd love to hear from you about what you what you reckon. Sure. I mean, if you had any thoughts about any of that going forward or you wanted to nuance any of the things I was presenting, I'd, you know. Be glad. You said, um, 
group. Like that's to build on that. Um, grouping your values when you don't have much content in one is really like uh, um, at the beginning characters were uh, in high bad mids and lows. I we but it worked for right uh, um kind of repainting their their map and they were strict their values to a very narrow cool way. So the characters and their all, all their power pop. So I mean it's like an extremely narrow value dollar range and it worked if you come before and after it's like a dramatic movement. So yeah dramatic practice so you can see it happening. So if you can find and after that I'm sure it's out there somewhere a good a, a good way to visualize how because uh, yeah some characters and so many colors and that's not one controlled palette. You have the red blue the basic really it's it's pretty um, so, like, has their own distinct colors, and so, like, you want to people instantly and identify who you're fighting against, how to count, you know, all that stuff. It's just very simple move on that. Wow. I know how to fix that. On my side, as much as I can. This doesn't work. I don't mind dropping out. But I know you know what I put. It's pretty good. Oh, now they can't hear me. Okay. They can okay, hear me. Can you also hear Max? <laughs> Not a matter of volume. Okay. All right. They're telling me they just can't hear you at all. Um, uh, Let's, you know, if, if you are willing to just hang out and, and do some paint overs, I can try and talk them through it and I'll keep, I'll keep you, how about we'll do this? I'll keep you in my headphones, but off the stream and then I'll sort of translate whatever it is that you're saying, uh, live over, over it. Um, so sorry, you guys, thanks for all your feedback. Really appreciate, uh, hearing from you guys as we're, we're trying to figure this out. What we're going to do is Max is going to do some paint overs. If you heard that. Um, and I'm going to just try and narrate both of our <laughs> stuff as we go. Um, and uh, Max, you can just, I just want to make sure I can still hear you. I can, but I think you're out of the, out of the, yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Okay. Well, um, let's dig in. Thank you guys for your patience. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, by all means, start to, start to go for it. I'm going to set up um, with something as well. And... Um, trying to think of like where, uh, and, and as you go, like if you have stuff, uh, you want to explain about it, just kind of send it my way and I will, I will do my best. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm. We'll have to go in like little chunks so I can translate for you while you're talking. So, um, so me. Absolutely. Okay. So what Max is observing, uh, in the the tower piece that he's pulled up is that there's a lot of contrast um, or rather not enough contrast. I should say, sorry. There's a, uh, there's a lot of uh, high level like uh, saturation and uh, similar levels of value up by the top where it's sort of against the sky. Um, uh, can you guys not hear me now? 
Uh oh. Well, try my best. Um, <laughs> so he's going to try and essentially the first step he's going to take is to punch out the foreground, the tower itself from the background and kind of balance those two things. That's not about right, Max. Okay. So what I'm observing here, uh, with this piece, um, is that, I mean, obviously you've done all of the work in terms of local color. I'm seeing a ton of, uh, great visual information. I love the design and what I'm see what I'm assuming is that the, the throne, the sort of shell throne here is your intended focal point, especially based on what you, uh, sent over, uh, uh, when you, uh, c contacted me with the piece. Um, so one of the things I am immediately seeing is, you know, I'm knocking down the level of contrast, essentially. That was the first step I took. It was to knock down contrast uh, throughout the piece just to give me um, something to work with. And then I'm, I'm throwing, like, a single haze of, like, medium blue over it really lightly. Um, and uh, trying to group all the colors in the space together by doing that. So sometimes it's really as simple in terms of like bringing colors together that are kind of fighting. Um, it's as simple as putting a single haze of blue or, or something to unite them all over them all at once. Cause right now the uh, level of value that I'm seeing, there's a really bright, oh, let me just call this out here with a better brush. It's a really bright white, uh, right here uh, that's really be, you know, sort of drawing a lot of focus to this particular uh, doorway and you're getting these lovely rays coming in from the moonlight but it's not really serving your focus as clearly it seems like this is a focal point and that this is also a focal point um, and I, I think I'm reading that right um, so by knocking that contrast back it's going to give us a a better place to, to start. Uh, I'm going to combine those two things into one layer so I can mask this out. So even just doing this and masking out what I just did in the areas of focus. So I'm just bringing back your original value right there at the throne. And then I'll bring back some value right here on the plinth uh, with the sort of glowing orb. So even there, I mean, <laughs> you're almost in business essentially. Um, you've you know maybe create some value leading up to it and what essentially you've done is sort of quiet down the the glare of moonlight on the water as it's coming through the the window there um and brought that contrast back to the places where you're really looking for it um one thing i i, I would like to see and i want to try there's these glowing uh, lanterns hanging throughout the space that are bringing like a nice warm light into it, but it's uh, threatens to take away a lot of attention if we do it wrong. So I'm just going you know, to play with those and see what we get. How about you, Max? How's it going over there? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so Max has sort of stepped down the contrast and value of the sky to the left of the tower in particular, um, where the the bright like light isn't hitting it, uh, so that the uh, contrast of the shadow of the tower stands out against the, the value of the sky. Is that about right, Max? Nice. So I'm seeing there's a, already a difference between like warmth and cool colors depending on where they fall in space here. Max, we can see your Discord. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Doxing himself. <laughs> no, I think it was me. <laughs> this is, uh, how many artists does it take to screw in a light bulb? Um... All good. So I'm just trying to see what I can do with these. So I don't want to lose the local color. Obviously, if they're glowing in the space, you know, they're not going to like be blue. <laughs> um, 
they're gonna have a lot of saturation to them on their own because uh, they're casting their own light but we don't want them to pull from the focal point so I think one of the main things from the original let's just keep the original on its own layer here that I'm doing is trying to knock down the contrast so that there's less white to them uh, in the original here we've got kind of a color that's really close to light uh, all the way white um, and I think by just reducing the contrast in value on these um, they're still there they're still definitely a part of the composition um, they what I would like to see maybe oh boy <laughs> is me using procreate better uh, is to see them lead my eye to the focal point so I think that's a design question here. And so what we have is an opportunity to increase contrast as it nears that focal point. So within these, kind of brightening them and warming them up um, as they get closer to the throne. And then we can bring that white brightness in as they get closer. And further out here, we can go can even introduce kind of a pink. Oh, I actually like how, how the so pink is a as a, as a really useful color. <laughs> it's something that I had a hang up about using for a long time. But man, like when you need pink, it does what it needs to do in a composition. Let's see. Just trying to see. I don't want to like. I know your your work. The style of your work is quite sharp. So I don't want to like lose all of that as we go. Um, so I'm not trying to suggest that you just like change the way that you draw. I'm just trying to sort of change the structure of what I'm observing. Um, so again, the difference right now is between that original and these are currently my, my changes there. Um, and yes, guys, this is going to be recorded, so you're going to be able to come back and, and sort of scrub through this later. <laughs> I hope that's, that's okay. Um, you know, another trick, since we have this all, all these on one layer, I want to try is just sort of playing with layer modes and seeing what we can get. So let's, I'm going to blur them. And then I'm going to just try what, what will hard light get us? And I don't like that. No. Yikes. I, you know, I don't, I, there's a couple layer modes I use reliably. Overlay is one I really tend to like. Um, but this is not getting me what I want. So I, but it, it will help me cool it down. So right now you're seeing a lot sort of pinker uh, light because I've created a very pink overlay layer and if I erase that as they get closer again to that focal point the focal center of the piece I think that's pretty good and it still gives you a second color you know it's not all just sort of versions of blue um, and you know let's just I mean why why not crank this up all the way You're right, there is some of that moonlight hitting, so we'll just kind of play with that. But there does seem to be kind of a warmth to the local light here. But we'll just, you know, crank the intensity. You know, you can use out-of-the-box kind of fuchsias here if it's your focal center. Um, and it can be pretty tasty if you've built up to that point, right? Um, but without building to that point, uh, uh, is Max having the image focus better by changing the contrast or did the amount of smaller details affect it since, uh, you painted over it in large swatches? So would you say it's, it's more to do with detail or contrast that you're adjusting Max?
Uh, oh boy, I was waiting for you to finish the thought. Um, can you say that again? I'm sorry, I did all that. <laughs> Mmm, I like that. So Max is trying to drive the focal attention towards the door of the tower. So his his read on the piece in general is that uh, if you were to, you know, look at this and, and where he would want you to sort of lock your attention would be at the entryway uh, of this space. So there's like a certain amount of it's not just that you're looking at the building. It's that you're wondering who lives there. You know, so you're sort of asking the right questions. So you look at it. Yes, and sorry, right now we are trying to do this uh, workaround with audio for Max because his audio is just coming in super choppy. Um, so you only are hearing me for that reason, and I am sorry. Uh, Yeti stereo multi-output device. I just don't know why. I'm going to try one more time, Max, if you could just give me a, a sentence. Sure. Max is trying. Is is that coming through clearly? I tried to click a different button this time. <laughs> All right, guys. Nope. Nope. Bad. Nope. <laughs> okay. okay. It's just not. It's not destined. Still choppy. Still broken. Ah, balls. Oh well. Yeah, I definitely would like to <laughs> to re up and, and give it another try, because um, you're definitely uh, meaningfully improving that piece. Oh gosh, the microphone thing. Uh, you sound like Sh uh, Shodan from System Shock. I don't know what that is. I don't know that it's a compliment. <laughs> you know, Max says that's what he's going for, so that's good at least. That's your new thing. Uh. I'm going to add a big shiny mark on this glowy thing over here. Um, let's see. Just trying to hack at this bit by bit. Just trying to frame the focus a little bit more. I'm not a big one on like, oh, I need to know exactly where the light source is coming from. Like the science of it doesn't interest me as much as like the, the effect in the end uh, of what it is I'm looking at. Uh, but I think the, the issue with this piece primarily that I'm working on is just that uh, there's just uh, a little too much going on in a, in a slightly unfocused way. Um, and that's why I thought, oh, that's a good example to work with. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. Look at that sky. That's much improved. Very good. Really nicely done. I mean, honestly, I don't know that I would do a whole lot more to it. Um... I think probably, you know, I want to be able to move on and, and, and try a bunch of these, but I think just trying to uh, lend that focus by bringing down contrast, uh, leading with warmth that sort of increases towards the focal center, um, uh, and framing it with darker elements that um, kind of create that space a little more clearly. I uh, hope that's helpful. I'm going to move on for a bit and see. Oh, my gosh. I don't know why. I don't know. I don't know why Siri. Oh, you're, uh, Max, if you just want to shout out last last things you've changed, and I can pass those on.
Nice. Looks so good. That's great. I don't know if you guys heard that. I tried to hold my headphone up to the mic like somebody's been suggesting. Um, but uh, yeah, the warm to cool movement is so much more powerful. The focus is so clear. That's great, man. Really well done. And the door just locks you right in. Um, Nice. All right, let's uh, let's try something else out. Let's see what we got here. Uh, boo, boo, boo. I don't know. I have them all sort of stuck in here somewhere, and I. You had mentioned the Spyro one. You thought was pretty good. I think you should probably give that a pass. You want me to do this? No, no, no. I'd I, since you had a specific idea, I don't know exactly what I want to do. Uh, okay, I'll drop Spyro. What would you suggest? So, Max, what was it that you were seeing with the Spyro piece in particular? Because for me, it's the the idea that the uh, lava uh, and the the focal center is actually like right at the base of the rock here. Um. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Definitely. Okay. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, I think you should do it. I really think you should do it. I would love to see you take a hack at it. Um, Max is going to take that Spyro piece on. Um, I believe that's by uh, uh, Peyton on uh, Twitter. Um, and I am going to take a hack at these guys. I think this one's fascinating because I, I love the, the characters are really cute. The composition is really interesting, uh, but they're just fading into the, the space so much at this point that I think there's definitely some things we could do to rescue the focal point here. It's a yeah, great shapes on the character says Max. So definitely, uh, lovely paint work here. Um, I love, like, sweaty tennis grandma. That is great. Max on speaker, maybe. Uh, let's let's try it. Why not? You know, I think there's a setting on this microphone that makes it two people, right? And then I'm going to... Okay, so now it's pointing in both directions. And I'm going to just crank you out of my c computer speakers? Let me just output internal speakers... Speak to me, Max. Hello. Oh my God, I can hear myself. Oh, you can hear yourself? That's a problem, huh? That's okay. You can deal with it. You can deal with that? If, everybody, if it works for everybody else, I can live with it. Uh, it seems like it works. <laughs> People can hear. Oh we're God. getting a lot of <laughs> excited <laughs> feedback from the chat about that one. So I think we're gonna okay. we're gonna keep it on that setting. Say, uh, the quick thing about the last piece, real quick, just. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I would much prefer hearing in your own words. Uh, cool. and then passing it on. <laughs> oh, you guys have been so patient. Thank you guys for sticking around while we fumble. <laughs> this, is, this is like old man stream today. <clears throat> <laughs> That's my specialty. Okay. That's right. You already the mustache for it. <laughs> so, um, so I've got basically just a quick summary of what I did for this piece. Um, it's a, it's a really nice like really really good foundation um i think just overall it's a contrast issue for me um the sky is the most contrasting part of this entire piece the values are really strong um here like very dark and very very light um so i would so my first instinct is to just crush it real fast um so that was why i did this first just lay it down and then um then i could kind of build up selectively on top of that. So now all of a sudden you do that and the rest of the tower just pops. Um, I also did a little bit of warm and cool in the sky, but that's not super important. I mean, it's nice, but it's not crucial necessarily. It's more about contrast. Um, and then the stuff that I did on the tower was, um, I think there was a bit of a light source problem where the 
the, I think, this really hard shadow here. Um, it's just a little too contrasty, a little bit too distinct for me, so I softened it, um, and I just spread it out across the landscape. Um, and I wanted to highlight the path so that it would lead your eye up to the to the door. So it just you, you had a way to walk into the space. Mm. And then I picked up these reds because reds, um, but there was just like this <laughs> nice little this nice red bit here, which I liked. So I was like, oh, let's put some flowers in it and make it look a little bit more inviting. Um, or just at least have an accent color to, to draw your eye in. So it only exists there. But it is, you know, it's you're making calls to it, which I like. So it's good color variation. There's a lot of good stuff happening. I don't want to, like, knock it. But I also um, rolled off some of the contrast back here and added some blues and reduced the values a little bit um, so that it would just sort of, like, round out the hill rather than just end sharply um, so that it would, again, keep more of your focus towards the door. And I also added just a little bit of a highlight on the, the um, awning just to, like, help you catch the light and really focus your eye. That looks awesome. Well done. <laughs> That's great. And it's so good to hear your voice. Yeah. I'm glad the check. And I'm sorry, you guys, uh, this is probably about as uh, <laughs> as good as it's going to get audio-wise. So I am uh, I'm sorry if that's not not ideal but i think we're good i think we're doing good so real quick for my strategy on this one I'm, i'll make this fast because i know this is no go for it man quality. keep it up i'm going to spyro is purple just like the spire principle we talked about this is perfectly on topic um i'm going to keep the purples away from most of the scene i'm going to allow spyro to be purple and take down some of the yellows and purples generally so that he is special and he has the most um purple and yellow, and then I'm going to make everything else kind of like a softer uh, orange and red sort of palette, generally speaking. Nice. Sounds good. I'm still sort of looking at this, trying to sort of figure out my approach. Uh, but primarily, I'm trying to knock the red down on the ground um, and find some value solves within the characters to try and pop them forward. Maybe just kind of push atmospheric perspective throughout this to see what we get. Now the silence of iPad work. <laughs> so I'm just going to start to mask stuff in first without getting too specific about what. Just a little bit of hazing goes a long way there. I'm gonna multiply. Really soft. I should sing. I should not sing. <laughs> you are wrong about that, my friends. I am tempted always on stream to sing, especially when I put music on, but. I feel like it's audio poison. I, I know at this age, like, I am fully out of touch with what what is cringe. I don't know. I don't understand it. I don't know why everyone is so concerned about it. But I, I, I definitely know I, I've i lost my cringe radar. Um, and I'm pretty sure I know one thing, and that <laughs> me belting loudly like the theater kid I really am uh, on live stream. While you just can't not listen, like, that would just... It's poison. I think it is poison for the ears. I shan't do it. So I know I said I was going to minimize purple, but I am going to roll it off towards cools on this because I think it's just red has a natural... Um, you can cool it off and warm it up so much, and it just does a lot for you, so I'm going to really lean into that here. Nice. Yeah, I like to live on the, the more fuchsia side of, of my reds, but... Mostly because I'm a coward. I generally do too. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
there's a lot of contrast on this kid in this painting, no matter which version of it. Uh, and I think that he's holding a lot of focus, but I kind of want to bring that level of of focal attention to the rest of the characters here, or at least frame it up a little bit more clearly. I'm adding a bit of steam here. It'll just look cool, but it also reduce the contrast against the background, so you're, it kind of leads your eye up, so the contrast isn't like hitting right at the lava level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Steam and haze, you know, it's a it's a classic concept art trick, uh, but we use when it so it often. Out, out, right? <laughs> it's a classic for a reason. Yeah, that's like the most Ethan Becker thing I've ever said. <laughs> I like that kid. I wish I, I I was hoping I would see some of his streams this weekend, but I've been so all out. Have you watched any streams, by the way, uh, while you've been working? Uh, I'm trying. I, I'm not ca keeping up with as much as I'd like, but I, I watched uh, Victor and Thomas Fluharty chat uh, yesterday, and I've, I've been watching some little bits of things. But it's like it's hard to keep up with other people's stuff when you're trying to do your own too. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah, it's like that at the real convention too. IRL. You oh, just totally. Like... But at least this time you're not uh, stuck to your table like you were last year. Yeah, exactly. You can get up and pee and eat. It's amazing. <laughs> Sometimes. I, the the nine-hour stream I did yesterday, I felt like at some point I had to like ask the chat's permission like a, like a teacher in <laughs> grade school. Like, can I pee, miss? Like, is it time now? Are we good I here? I honestly don't know how you turn around for that. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not superhuman. You understand that. <laughs> It was pretty wild, though. It was really, really helped with the fact that, like, Claire and John joined in. Um, yeah. And uh, just having somebody else on the stream just makes it so much more fun. Um, just to, like, keep the energy going? Because otherwise it's just... You become very quickly conscious of the fact that it's just you talking alone in a room to yourself. Um, oh, yeah. Just like normal, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Except then I do sing. <laughs> it's just me and the worst vocalizations I have to offer. So I'm going to do, I'm going to, I want to call this out. Um, this is something that I do a lot. Um, this rim light is a little too strong for me. Um, I think rim lights are really easy to get off. Um, just to add too much contrast right here is a ton of contrast. So like um, that green and that yellow and that red is like just that's, oop, oh no, what am I doing? Stop it. Uh, <laughs> one second. Um, <laughs> but it's just too punchy for this area. So I want to try to make sure that Spyro is the punchiest. Um, what did I do? What? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, sorry. There I am. So I'm just reducing contrast. I'm trying to minimize the, the rim lights and kind of eliminate most of them. Um, in this case, if I wanted to add one, I, I might add one to pop the back of Spyro off, like with a cool color. You know, like a limited cool color. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let me try that. Might be too much, but let me try. Uh, right here, oh, oh, <laughs> I just pulled a, what the heck? There we go. I, uh, I'm trying to just draw, knock back some of the contrast so that the interaction between uh, the older woman and the, and the, uh, the kid uh, referee holds the, the center of the focus here. Um, and I think right, you know, before there was a lot of the fence um, and the ground and stuff like that were really competing um, pretty heavily. And it's cheating, and we're still using a really strong red on the ground here, but the movement between like a cooler kind of fuchsia towards a more saturated kind of cad cadmium red, um, I think is, is going to help a lot. Um, but I think just, just cutting her out in terms of value from the background is important. I really liked, there was a professor, uh, our big like pers perspective teacher uh, in art school, and he taught us all these rules about perspective, and then the, the main thing he landed on at the end was sort of like, if it looks wrong, it's wrong. Um, mm -hmm. And I really like that. That advice always annoyed me, but it's true. <laughs> are you you want the more like science solution or no I, I think it's totally valid like it, it took me a while to understand what, what people said when they met when they said things like that mm -hmm. you know ultimately it just 
like I, early in my career, I was too obsessed with getting things like physically accurate because I had learned all this stuff because of CG about like how to light, you know, quote unquote correctly and get the physics of light to work the way you want. But it's like at the end of the day, if it looks stupid, just don't do it. You know, like you have to. It, it's all about editing and choices and everything else. What I'm realizing as I remove this too is this is an interesting movement. Uh, towards this intensely saturated green that goes straight off the composition over to the side here. And what I've done by hazing it back into sort of a, a, a mistier purple kind of uh, space is eliminate that. But there's there's a good instinct there. It's just headed the wrong direction. It's like a like you just need to pull the switch on the train tracks and like throw that green <laughs> in reverse. And oh, where's my green? Come on and throw that closer to your focal center. But yeah, I mean, we, we, we talked uh, earlier when we called before the stream and, and uh, you like have a, a, a much more technical handle on like the whys and wherefores of color. Um, and uh, I've been thinking about that a lot since because I think like there's just so many different ways in uh, to this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I really liked. It. I was. It was cool to hear from you. One of the people I, I learned from early on, and it was. I'm. I'm the reverse of that. You know, where you 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 were hearing things like, if it looks right, it's right, and feeling angry, and I, I was like, yay, that's what I want to hear, um, <laughs> and then I was hearing things from. Uh, I think it was Sam Nielsen, so Art Sandwich, um, who, uh, was like doing like ambient occlusion passes in his character designs. Yeah. And I just, I hated it. I was so mad. I was like, that's not art. That's science. Uh, and now I totally do it. <laughs> do it all oh, the time. Completely. Oh, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's the way I'm uh, kind of, uh, how, how, what would you say? It's sort of like abstracting a useful uh, and realistic feature. You know, it, it's not realistic in the strictest sense, but if it gets the job done, who cares? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. That's the that's the thing. And I, I came around to it. Uh, eventually, you know, being like, okay, all right, all right. I see the value of, of the more scientific approach, the more structured approach. Um, so the last thing I'm going to do to this is I'm just, I'm going to step on some of these really saturated kind of primary secondary colors. Um, I think this is working pretty well though. Um, let me take a look at the original. There you go. So it's really just simplifying the value structure. If you look at it, the closer you get to the lava, the brighter it gets. And the silhouette of this cliff and spire is working really well now. Um, mm -hmm. The one thing I want to do is, like, green yeah. is still really raw. Purple's really raw. And this highlight is really almost metallic feeling, if that makes sense. And so I want to pull a little bit of warmth into that. I want to sort of tone down these accent colors. Because they're good to use. It's, it, I think they'll work well in the palette, but they are kind of just a little too strong right now. So, hmm. um, one thing we talked about in our chat earlier was uh, kind of crayon box colors. Yep. You know, if you take a look at this color, this is really strong, uh, or at least it's reading really strong. It's actually, you know, pinks are extremely intense. I would pull that down and a little bit red, given the context. I, I'm I'm wary of going too red given it's spiro i don't want to like eliminate what makes spiro spiro but i think a warmer red it's maybe not oops, shoot, might be a little too much but like i'll i'll dial that in but i'm, I'm going to try to simplify see these like disconnected islands of bright and dark i'm going to try to pull those together and group those values so they make a, a more cohesive shape so i'll start with the actual color that's there just to, for simplicity i'm just going to try to hit that in a, in a clearer message. So, I'm trying to like define that contour really, really nicely. Mm. I'm going to reduce the contrast of all these scales because I think that they're just too strong. I think it, you know, it goes into like, again, grouping values. You don't want to like over contrast your local uh, contrast areas. So, you just want to make a clearer, simpler statement with your values. Mm. So that's where things like you've got kind of three lines here you know it's like this really like 
orange, black, orange, black, or it's like purple, orange, black, black, you know, it's, it's a lot. It's kind of an echoing and it's making the silhouette a little hard to read. Um, so I'm just going to define that front plane. Because uh, he's got, correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, you're, you're the expert. <laughs> Does he have kind of a boxy nose up? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I like to turn the, the cool. form there. Uh, in the model, it tends to soften out a bit, but I really prefer the sort of boxy thing. And I think that with yeah. the art style of the piece, that, that works really well. Totally. So I'm just going to do that. And so all of a sudden, now you've got a really clear read on that plane of the face, you know? And then I'll hit around the eyes, too, just a little bit on, on the brow. Kind of clean all that stuff up a little bit. I'm not staying super on model because, I, I, you know, you're making stylistic choices that are really cool, and I, I'm not as familiar with the intricacies of you know, either what you're trying to do and the original inspiration. Um, like, I don't have it in my head. I apologize, Nick. It's nothing not personal, I promise. Man, how dare you? I don't know. You came here <laughs> to my house. Right. You didn't even research the <laughs> boy I was hired to... <laughs> you're fine. I'm also going to hit that cool color on the nose. just helps you um, define kind of a good focal point again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I'm kind of like simplifying. I'm going cool and purple on the back, and I'm going to go warmer and redder in the front. So I'm always kind of uh, helping reinforce the, the, the basic color spiral. I think the back could be maybe a little bit more like on model color. Slightly kind of like sort of like cooler magenta. And then the front, I'll make just a little warmer. Mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. quick thing. This. There you go. That shadow is really nice. Nice. Uh, I am just trying to navigate piece by piece here. It's really a push and pull. When we, I think we, maybe Max, you and I talked about this. I don't remember if it was us or just generally been on my mind lately. But uh, when recipes say like season to taste, um, you know, like you're, you add a little, you take a little, you balance it. Oh, a little lemon, a little salt, mm -hmm. a little something else. You know, you're trying to like get it just in that right zone. Um, where it works for you. And there's no like hard and fast rule about how much contrast or whatever, because it's, it's just a constant push and pull between like, oh, that was too much. Oh, well, not enough there now. Um, uh, and so I think that, you know, I'm gonna knock these back too. I don't know that these need quite as much going on. But overall, I mean, it's not, it's not a perfect solve here, but I think that We've definitely improved the focal uh, attention. Um, let's see. Let me just back up here really quick. Um, so here's the original with my changes. Original with my changes. So largely it's it's been about sort of working towards pulling uh, the... Where did that go? pulling the, the, the interaction central to frame kind of into focus um, so that you really don't feel like you're bouncing all around the piece too much. You've still got local color present in everything, but uh, you're just knocking it back down. Um, it's kind of like, it, you know, you're hitting this haze that doesn't really exist in real life uh, that's kind of knocking back the, the railing there, but you can kind of blame that on a lens flare. You can either you even go like pretty dramatic with it um, and own that. Um, let me see if I can create the effect. Throw some bokehs in there. Uh, Everything's better with bokehs. Knock those way back. Throw a layer mode on them. Um, I don't know. You know what I mean. Kind of... Get that summary haze. Another, th another little trick I like to do sometimes is like, <laughs> this isn't the piece for it, but I, I just uh, I think it would be funny to throw the kitchen sink at this and just like little dust particles of your magical moment caught in the light right where the camera is focused. <laughs> it really changes the tone of the whole thing. <laughs> now they're in love. You know, they're just... <laughs> now they're just now this this little this little lad's trying to move in on his on his girl. 
What are you doing? <laughs> He's standing right there, little lad. Mr. Stelia girl. <laughs> Mr. Stelia girl over here. Offer her a towel. <laughs> Do it. Okay, I'm gonna call this done. That looks awesome, man. Great job. Um, so one thing I did on the gem, I reduced their contrast dramatically. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I turned to the form. See, I've got that like rim light blue color kind of popping on them, but it's the same value more or less as as their silhouette. So I'm um, I'm not hitting it as bright as I did on Spyro. So I'll I'll do a little before and after part on this. Do it. Yeah, there you go. There we go. Oh, wait. So all that yellow and purple is just a little redundant for Spyro. So I'm trying to like reduce the value contrast across the board so that Spyro is the focal point. Nice. And just a little bit of atmosphere helps. So there you go. Good deal. Cool. We're moving on. Right, this piece live. Next piece. Okay. I think I got one more in me. How about you? Cool. Yeah, that sounds good. Let's see. I'll save these uh, as uh, PSDs or something so you guys can uh, play with them later and break down what I did. That's generous of you. I like oh, I'll charge them for it, though. <laughs> there he is. By the way, Max has a new brush pack out, and it's extremely good. Oh, thanks. And you should definitely go check it out. And let's absolutely use the space to plug it. Um, <laughs> Maxpacks.com. Maxpacks.com, man. Get to it. It's gorgeous stuff. I use this stuff all the time for various things. I use this shader pastel just basically nonstop. Um, that, bl that brush is legendary. And in fact, if you got the $10 tier of, um, of the Lightbox tickets, you got that in, the, in my goodie bag brushes. Oh yeah, that's I love seeing that that you did the the goodie bag giveaway. Yeah, that was fun. I like doing stuff. Okay, Nick, which one should I do next? I've got this fisherman here, or uh, or this Tower of Babel looking thing back here. I don't know if you can see my screen. Yeah, definitely. I'm trying to think what people seem to struggle with more. Both have sort of similar focal issues. Uh, I kind of want to see you do the fisherman though. I just think it's. Uh, oh. I think this is a, a slightly bigger challenge, but it's a really nice piece. I like the drawing, so I want to go for this. I think this is cool. Nice. Um, again, this, so the overall thing is kind of a value control issue, I think, more than color. As is true with, I, I, it's so related. It's hard to, you know, hard to see the the difference, I guess. But if you do this, like your color is actually helping you with your focal point, because like that purple is really intense. And it just naturally leads you to the focal point. And there's like some darkness that's happening, but I think there's just too much local contrast everywhere. So there's whites everywhere. There's whites all over the water in a similar frequency that are kind of eating up all your lily pads. Um, there's like, it's basically just like the same shape is echoed and the same size. And so if we can um, simplify your value range per item, everything will read. So let's start with that have some ideas here but I'm, I'm loath to I feel like uh like as we begin this sort of thing like like I, you're calling your shot in pool where you're like left pocket and I'm like I don't <laughs> know what exactly we're gonna land on but my sense is that the sky is just a little too hot in the wrong places so far it's one of the first things I'm seeing I think that the I'm value the, it's a super cool piece yeah really cool. yeah it's really clean there's a the colors and just in the space uh, really kind of meld well. You know, there's nothing that feels too wildly out of place. But I really want to lock us in on the characters here uh, and the sense of of awe and fear uh, that we would get from a scenario like this. Um, yeah. So first, I'm gonna haze this our big snake back a little bit into the color of the sky. Um, I think that's gonna get us a lot. Uh, we still That'll want that scale too. contrast, but it's all about that scale. You just want to feel the enormity 
of this spirit kind of emerging out of the clouds. So already that's getting me a lot more what I want. I'm going to try and heat up, heating up the red, but the way that it had been set up, the red was kind of shifting, like the, the, the heat was up at top, uh, kind of pulling us away from focal centers. So I'm going to try and bring this kind of fuchsia red into the... into the focal center zone. Somebody uh, asked, how do you stylize colors? Uh, when you think of vegetation, it's green, sky's blue, etc., etc. Uh, how do you find a new harmony uh, and leave the colors that you're used to? Max, how would you, how'd you feel that one? Ooh, um, it broke up a little bit. It was, it was how do you stylize colors uh, for things that aren't like kind of commonly. Well, yeah, uh, even even guess, the right? even the stuff that you're used to, like you know, sort of uh, how do you how do you push away from, you know, if if suddenly you decide that the sky is not blue, you know, where would you even begin? Um, I think a lot of it for me comes from observation. Actually, uh, you know, you say it's not there, but there's often hints of stuff that you can mm -hmm. pick out. So I, I actually don't just like throw silly colors into the sky for no reason. It's um, it's frequently kind of inspired by real skies I've seen, you know, like if, if you are putting greens in the sky, like I, if you've ever seen a tornado coming or, you know, looming, that stuff really tends to turn skies yellow and green and these kind of unusual colors. We've got fires in California right Jeez, now and that's yeah. turning the sky in the same colors. So I think a lot of it comes from just lived experience and like, um, pulling from unusual realistic things. But I think, you know, sometimes you just, pick a color like we were talking about um well I, I did that ufo piece with like a big fuchsia um ufo and, sky and everything else that's really fun to play with and i picked that color because it is unusual and because it is punchy and kind of a difficult thing to work with as a background color um but then i wanted to sort of prove to myself that i could in the same way that like my my red and green stalker assassin guy i use like really difficult colors to manage as a challenge to myself. Mm. And so sometimes it's just, I'll throw it in there just to like say, you know, screw all the haters who think that you can't make a red background work. <laughs> and like, you know, cause like- All I those haters. the rules on that, but it, mm. you know, it, I made it manageable. You know, it is mm. definitely a challenge, but sometimes that's how you break through those boundaries and kind of learn where to push at the rules. Yeah, I think that, you know, from what we were talking about earlier with, like, um, limiting your palette, uh, if you if you train with your weights off, you know, and, and sort of work from observation first, then you, you know, shift something completely, you know, turn the sky, you know, total burnt sienna orange or whatever, then you're going to have the tools kind of to hand uh, in terms of how to manage that and sort of work around it and... and make it feel natural or right or just like sit in space the way that you want um yeah in a way that um that you might not if you just go straight for the stylization like don't don't eat your candy first you know uh start with learning the the way that it, it does work in nature and and work away from that i, I think it's pretty yeah pretty trite advice but it, it it's you know you hear it often for a reason I wanted to do something in this piece. I think the uh, the composition is a little tricky for me. This tangent at the very top is a no-no for sure. Um, I wouldn't put the bobber so close to the left side of frame. So I'd say like, I think we're just a little bit too far out at the edges, um, which is something I have a problem with frequently too, by the way. Mm. I tend to pack my stuff pretty tight in frame. Um, I think I'm, to be perfectly honest with you, I think I'm succumbing to social media Instagram thumbnail pressures mm. in many cases. That's real. Or, yeah. or also like I'm character focused, and so like I just want the character to be real big. And sometimes that negative space and that breathing room is extremely important and underappreciated. So I'm going mm. to um, reframe this a little bit. Just zoom out, add a little air. Yeah, 
compositional sketching is something I I need, you know, like I really need to solve a lot in a thumbnail. Um, I, f I find it very stressful and hard to solve it on the fly if my thumbnail isn't, you know, kind yes. of functioning and giving me breathing room and um, Yeah, anything that gets complicated like this, I always do a thumbnail with, for sure. Mm. Just trying to bring focus down on the serpent's face here by increasing contrast, uh, sculpting some cheekbones. I'm going to try and pop those eyes out a little bit. Um, but it seems like the a little bit of underlighting gets you. It's sort of emerging from the mist of, of the space, uh, so the the darker darks are happening closer to the front of the face. And these little characters, I mean, I've basically taken the the direction of the red and funneled it down in kind of a big triangle uh, towards the characters on the plinth here. Um, in the hopes that that drives the contrast and focus where we want it. And that's still pretty cold and pretty low sat, so I think we could eke that up a little bit. So if you squint in this piece, I like what's happening with this with the the overall color on this water. It's it's lighter at the top left here, where it's suggesting a light source, which is good. And then it's darker down here, which naturally does happen when you look down at water. It tends to get darker and more transparent, and it's more reflective as you look up. So I'm going to lean into that because I think that's useful. Mm. Um, and I'm going, and it'll, it'll also help define the character by giving more contrast towards the top of frame. So I'm just going to push it like that. That's awesome. Good call. And then it also helps me by giving me something that I can do some reflections with, which is always fun. So I can do a little bit of this. Another uh, another way, and this is a design thing rather than a color thing, but another way to establish scale is with scale <laughs> of marks. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know that's the reason why in a lot of paintings you'll have the little birds, the little uh, these little guys, you know, just sort of to inform you like oh dang he's huge um we could do that with the little birds you know kind of in, in the space to uh to establish that uh contrast but we can also do that with the scale of mark making on the character um so rather than you know uh, relying just on a, a trick like throwing some white birds in there when you don't really want little white birds in your universe um maybe getting into into the details here and this looks kind of like a what am I thinking of? Is it a, a coelacanth's uh, tooth? Um, I hope you're not adding me. <laughs> I, I don't know yet. I'm trying to explore this design a little bit, but it, it has kind of that single plate tooth look of a certain dinosaur, who's uh, aquatic dinosaur whose name escapes me right at the moment. I think it's a coelacanth. Um, and maybe just a little bit, you know, I'm not saying this is the right move per se, but some some smaller scale detail around the center of the face. Um, where you're going to be looking, you know, is where you want to sell scale. So if I'm driving the focus to the face of the serpent, uh, that's where I want to see, you know, maybe maybe you want to throw a couple little, like, barnacles or, or freckles on it or just, just anything you can do. And it's not like, oh, go in there and fill it with detail. That sucks. It's not what you want. Uh, you do just want to have a little bit of detail right where you need to look for it that tells us how big this thing is because uh, that's going to help us feel awe and terror. Cool. And I want to feel awe and terror! So <laughs> friggin' help me! <laughs> I am not scared enough in 2020. I would like to be scared by your giant <laughs> snake, please. <laughs> Please make me more afraid with your art. So I'm going to do this. This kind of follows along the last one a little bit. We're, we're kind of dealing with the similar purple, which is a, definitely a tricky color to use. But from a value perspective, these stripes aren't going to 
make your life any easier, but you know, this is the design of your character and I'm not going to change it. We're gonna work around the, the challenge. Um, I, I want to group my values more carefully, so I wanna to try to combine some of these values by reducing the contrast between that and the stripes. Um, so I'm going to try to like define a light side and a dark side. And I think that will help, just because like these tiny little highlights make them feel uh, metallic. And I think if, if you spread it out, we'll get more of a feeling of kind of a more matte, furry sort of vibe, which I think is sort of important for this piece. I uh, think they were going for to, a furry vibe, yeah. Yeah, and that, that's, that's my impression too. So I think, um, and we, I'm going to let the eyes be a little dark because I think that will help us give a little bit of contrast in the area, so I'm not going to over flatten. Um, and I'm going to let the tail kind of stay a little bit dark, I think. Um, I do think we have maybe a little bit of an issue with the light source, because if you take a look down here, um, there's kind of an equal, almost equal power to light source coming from, well, from here and from here. And so I want to simplify that. Um, and I, but I like what you're doing here. This is cool. I like seeing caustics. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn the shadow side cool and do the uh, light side warm. So that'll establish that they're standing in front of water and that's, uh, it just connects uh, this character to the world. Sort of similar to what we did with Spyro, actually. As, as I look at these two, they're, they're related in that way. So I think this is a cool one to play with. Purple animals. They're all alike. Who doesn't love a good purple animal? <laughs> Are you aware that that is Big the Cat from Sonic the Hedgehog? You know, I, actually, no. I, I stopped playing Sonic when I was, uh, it, or like, after Genesis, probably. I, I probably didn't uh, keep up with the, the franchise, I'm afraid. Sorry, guys. Oh, you're fine. I just uh, was wondering. And also, when you mentioned, like, oh, this is your character design, I was like, ah, yes. OC, oh, do, well, the, do not steal. <laughs> yeah. But you can see I'm kind of like reducing the contrast of the stripes and just sort of defining the overall shape of the character's That's good. Um, face. I'm going to wrap this highlight under the eye a little bit just to let me clean this shape up because I think that's really important to the read of that face. You know, like if you get too many sort of like disconnected things or like unclear shapes like and when i say shapes i'm like this is a nice clear face mask kind of shape that i want to define um so i'm just going to hit it really hard and then reduce the contrast like kind of roll off the surface so kind of define the difference of like form shadows and cast shadows just a little bit of that will help there you go that's nice Let's see. I'm trying to. I want to see what happens if I increase the overall darkness contrast on this plinth here. Uh, one thing that I did uh, was really heat up, bring back some of the the green here. And so as the sort of triangle of red kind of comes to sort of focus down on the two characters uh, on this uh, plinth, um, the sort of uh, teal aquamarine kind of uh, also increases to kind of lock us focally in. Um, and feel more threat, you know, kind of magical threat. I'm not really sure what the, you know, uh, the function of these whisker uh, appendages is, but they don't seem nice uh, under the circumstances. Um, they seem like sort of uh, to be playing the role of teeth compositionally here. Um, so maybe even, even hotter than that. And just giving them a little bit of rim light cast from those really intense shadows and then maybe maybe a darker top of the plant here we'll see we'll see how this goes the other thing I'm seeing now is that I want <laughs> some vignetting a little bit to give us more examples of like foreground dark and use a purple for that mm -hmm. 
And at any point we can go, you know, we can turn this thing to 11 and really crank up some of these. I'm not sure that that's, you know, right for the balance per se, uh, or the tone that you want. You know, it really, at a certain point becomes a question of art style, um, you know, how saturated certain things go or, you know, um, so I don't, trying to work within the stylistic realm that you're establishing without pushing too crazy hard in a different direction. Um, but, I don't know, just, just mess around with the design stuff a little bit too as we go, just to see. I really like this image, and I, I like the the sense of the world it implies. And it's got good vibes, for sure. So I'm starting to take some of these shadows cooler to imply the, the bounce light from the, the water, which I really like. Because we started to do it, so I'm going to take that and run with it, because it's just kind of cool. So I'm going to try to like turn a lot of these forms and simplify. And uh, oh, this is a good opportunity for a uh, ambient occlusion right there. Just like give it a nice little contact. Hey. It's nice to give it some color. You know, our old friend. I like to turn form with, uh, with hue or color rather than value a lot of the time. Even with, or you know, or I'll do it with both. Uh, like uh, especially where, in the case of, I'm, sorry, I'm being a little bit loose with a lot of this stuff of course but um if you have cool shadows conceivably that light source is cool and it is not connecting to that it's getting blocked by the arm for example so we've got this like nice warm rich kind of like purpley red i'm going to use that for my contact shadow it's not it's not super dark or it's not like way darker than that um than that value here but it is describing a form change which i like if that makes sense. Mm. To me, it does. But I know. So, like, it, you don't have to just do it with value, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. It could be saturation, it could be color, it could be hue, it could be all these different things that you can use to turn form that aren't necessarily just value. You have a lot of tools at your disposal. Yeah. So, I'm going to simplify this shape on the chest. It's kind of like light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. There's a lot of texture in that. And like texture is a hard thing to manage, but I think you have to uh, consider sort of like the shapes you're implicitly making is here is like one shape, here's another shape, kind of here's another shape, here's another shape, here's another shape, and then you've got sort of this like patchy thing going on here. What I would say, I'm gonna lean into that. I like stylizing um, noise and fur like that, so let's make a shape out of it because everything you do is a shape. You know, whether it's implicit or accidental, it, you're still making shapes. So I'm going to do this. I'm just going to, like, kind of haze it down a little bit so I have a little bit more value control because it's just a little contrasty for me. But let's play with this. Let's lean into what you're doing here. So I'm just trying to get, like, a nice light mid-tone so that I can push it up and down. And do the same thing to some of these others. This is actually pretty good over here, so I'm going to leave that. Actually. Let's let's look at what you did with the face, like the kind of muzzle, which is working really well. Oops, come on. Let's make sure that's clean. Because I think that works great, you know? That's really cool. I might pick out this whisper on the back, just because, just for simplicity. And then... then that's our new shape. And then what we can do is we can break up that edge in a designed way. Mm-hmm, yeah. So imply fur without, like, rendering every hair. I'm such a big fan of implying fur without <laughs> rendering every hair. That is so much... It's such a bird and it's a contrast nightmare if you, if you don't get it right, you know? So and, and also, you just get to, like, echo these this nice shape language you have. You know, it's such a cool thing to be able to play with, and, like, it's not as hard as it seems, you know? Like, this is actually very doable, and it's not super difficult. Um, like, this isn't... Anybody can do this. It's just a more matter of choices. So there you go. 
I think that's actually pretty effective. And it looks furry, and it looks kind of in a Sonic sort of uh, stylization world. So I think that's good. Totally. You know, we're not trying to like reinvent the wheel here. We're just trying to like improve what's here. So let's maybe do that. Let's um, do a bit more kind of like stripiness, or sort of like work with the shapes that we've got. So I'll, uh, I'll sort of pull some of these forward. I'll sample some of these same colors. I'm starting to near the point where I feel like I've taken this where I want it to go. Uh, so here's our great. here's our original, and yeah. with those adjustments, original adjustments. Very um, cool. So again, I, I you know just to walk through some of the decision making there, uh, especially with the green, because now that I've created this like kind of teal focal point around the characters, sort of being intimidated by the serpent. Um, let me just get my line out here so this this is creating like a compositional triangle uh right here uh, but it's so intense that it felt like it needed to be affecting the clouds around it uh light wise um uh kind of just sets the, the the scene for it kind of blends that uh striking color into the environment around it um but i didn't want it to pull focus away from the the exact moment compositionally where we want it to be um, so all of this stuff in the clouds is much lower saturation. It, their colors relating to the teal light, um, but they're stepping back by inches. And here you're seeing some of that um, sort of just pure color differentiation. There's not a lot of value change between the blues and the, the reds that are kind of bouncing around in these clouds. If you actually look at clouds, that happens a lot. There's this, um, oh man, I mean, they're not catching always like a ton of direct light depending on the lighting scenario. Um, and because we're outside of the realm of, like, photorealism here and really into more of, like, a Samurai Jack-adjacent designiness, uh, I don't feel compelled to, like, have to make sure that the clouds are receiving light that looks like real-world cloud light and that everything has the, like, red where it would naturally have the red if there was this much red and stuff like that. We don't really need to get into that. We just need it to draw our eye where we want our eye to go. Um... And so I think that's that's where I'm at with that one. Um, personally, for me, if it were my own piece and not knowing anything about the story, I would add, like, little babies. <laughs> it's fully a, a design decision. Um, but uh, I, I don't know who this being is and whether they would have little, like, children, but it's just a fun scale thing. It gives you more creatures to play with. Um, uh, and those are both fun wins. Um, so instead of just the like flock of generic white birds, you could have sort of smaller sort of rifts on the serpent surrounding it, or you could knock them back in space um, even further. There's so much you can do, you know, if we get away from just sort of color questions and we can sort of imply coils of the snake like going in and out of the clouds and the now i'm getting into it all right well here we go it's too late now <laughs> gotta paint more snake uh I think, I think that's a smart choice that's cool i think just just trying to make these characters feel trapped and uh what i was hurting for earlier was foreground elements and now i know what i want to do with that i want them to feel completely surrounded so we've got these plinths in the foreground that are kind of locking us in this dark space that's vignetting the whole thing. Um, what we're going to add to that is some coiling snake body that frames it all. You love that, especially in like animation. You'd love to see a sort of out-of-focus foreground serpent piece kind of like slither and constrict around the focal point just to be like oh no they're really screwed <laughs> um, and maybe maybe we get to see the end of the tail but it's like all the way over here so they are in this thing's realm now and it's not a good situation It's 
So I'm going to do one thing compositionally. We got something breaking up that silhouette there. We got like that post that I think was just in the way. So I'm going to get rid of that because I think that's just distracting the composition. And again, I think we also have like local contrast kind of balance issues here. So I'm going to reduce the, the wood grain because it's just not that important. Um, I'm over doing this with the purple shadows, but I, I like what you're doing, so I'm gonna I'm gonna lean into it. Cause like really right here, the the darkest part of the light side is as dark as your shadow side. So I wanna I wanna group those values so they have more relationship. And I'm gonna use a warmer color so we can again turn this. Let's see how do, how do I do this? We can turn this by by like color uh, and not as much by value because I want to group those values. So maybe lighten. Let's see how that goes. So you can still see the wood grain. This is over. I'm overdoing this, but yeah, it's still there. It's very strong. You'll, you'll forgive me if this is just cartoony and ridiculous, but. It's kind of working to reduce the distractions from your focal point. I'm a little unclear about the light direction on this, so I'm, I, I haven't really fully committed to this. Um, and I probably should have done, but it's too late now, and I've, uh, I've, I've kept it going. But I think this is sort of close. That's not bad. That's pretty close. Um, then I'll just turn the opacity down this a bit. But you get the idea of what I'm doing. I'm trying to like just group the values to the point where the light side is still, generally speaking, lighter than the shadows. You know, even when there's value changes within that group. So there you go. I think that's actually not bad. And so one thing I did on this that um, I do frequently on a lot of my paintings. Um, I'm gonna keep playing with this a little bit, but like. Um, I do this thing where I, I like to, if I have kind of a lot of color going on, I do this, it's almost like an Instagram filter. <laughs> it's, a, it's a total cheat, but it actually really works. Um, and I like to multiply a warm color or just any light color, but mm -hmm. it's, I tend to use kind of like a, a washed out yellow orange. And then I'll screen its complement like a very dark purpley blue. In this case, I've made it more purple because of the color of the piece. Um, and the, the result is that it just kind of, it's so subtle, but it um, just sort of pulls the colors together and reduces the contrast a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. see that? Yeah. It kind of gets rid of some of the stray, um, stray hues and some of the, that kind of distortions. So here's the original. I could, I could definitely do more with this, but I, I like, but basically the, the value structure is working now. And that was the biggest issue here. Let me, I'll play a little bit more with the water because obviously I'm not really doing much of the waves, but that's kind of a big commitment to start getting into into waves and all this stuff. But like you could, um, you know, just well, you want to try to keep your values contained. So yeah, you, like you don't want to all of a sudden just create so much visual noise that it takes away from your focal point. So I'm really wary of what I'm doing right now. I'm trying not to do a lot. So one thing I've been doing a lot lately in terms of, of Final Pass kind of Instagram filter style stuff, uh, I've really been enjoying. I'll, I'll take the whole piece at the end. So I've copied it into one layer. I'll just duplicate it so that I, I have a comparison. I'll go into curves. And then I'll like crunch some of the curves together, which kind of decreases contrast in an interesting sort of dynamic way. Um, yeah. You can increase and really pump up contrast if that's the look you want to go for which is also cool in this piece. Because again, like I, I, one of the things that's happening here is it's not about the exact colors you're putting down, it's about the structure. And right now the structure is like really solid. And it was solid when we started. I think we've, you know, kind of pushed it further, but now, you know, no matter how much contrast you pull or push out of it, you're still holding on to that, that core uh, structure. But I like uh, the effect that crunching the, the curves together gives, because it just, I don't know, it kind of brings them all in a little closer to each other. And that gives me something I can punch from. Um, if that's a, not a term. So I've, I've crunched this together with curves. 
Uh, now I can mask that away. Um, and I've made a, a bluer version of the layer where I treat the, the colors towards blue. So if I go into the mask and I paint um, black near the focal center, it'll cool off just in those areas that I want to be cooler and more in focus. So I can play similarly to what Maxis did with dynamics of color. And even compared to my paint over, you know, now I have like kind of a, an interesting vignette. Um, and maybe that's your speed and maybe that's not. It's kind of a stylistic choice one way or the other. Um, you could be an honorary uh, VFX artist with, with that kind of talk. That's basically compositing. You, you, do, you basically create a flat pack. Call it a flat pass. Mm -hmm. If that's what you would get out of your camera and with all your VFX, you're going to comp it in a very naturalistic way, you know, as if it was realistic. And then you're going to take that and color grade it um, and do like your color corrections on top of the result of that. So that's, I do frequently do that a lot, especially, you know, when I work in Photoshop, I do that a lot more just because I have all the adjustment layers that I like to play with. And you can really turn that stuff on and off and everything floats and it's not committal. Uh, but what, you know, I do the same thing too. If I feel like I'm doing something a little bit more cinematic minded or um, sometimes, you know, if it's just really complex, I'll do that. I'll flatten it, contrast it at the, at the end and color grade it and stuff, but it's a little hard to reproduce. So that's why I hesitate doing it too frequently. I try to get as much contrast in, in the process if I can, and then I'll flatten that and continue painting um, if it feels right to do so. But mm. Totally. Yeah, I'll, I'll go in and paint over this sometimes if it, if it needs to be, you know, tweaked or brought out. Sometimes you lose local color stuff that's really nice when you do this kind of overall kind of filtery pass. Um, and like Max just said, yeah, going back in and like being, you know, like, oh, I lost some of the pink in these eyes, for instance. Um, and that was really holding my attention. So I'm going to go back in there right over the top and just throw some pink back in there. I just realized I started playing with some, I kind of started defining the sunlight a little bit harder here, and I, I like what that's doing, so I'm going <laughs> to carve off some nice little, like, uh, hot spots just to help you just... light and also give you that kind of, like, fringy, velvety, um, furry feeling, which I think is nice on a piece like this. Talk yourself in. Pop, pop a little pop more work. the background. <coughs> And the air quality here is bad today. How are you uh, over there, by the way, Max? Are you keeping safe? Yeah, my, my, I have friends on evacuation watch, um, Oof. which is a little scary. But, yeah. And it ha they have been for, for five days now or something like that. It's crazy. I'm safe where I'm at unless there's, like, an absolute catastrophe, <laughs> which I don't expect. Um, but, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's been a little nuts. I'm not thrilled about it. Yeah. Oof. My uh, uh, um, grandparents are actually, well, my, my, my wife's grandparents, I should say. So our, I guess they're my grandparents-in-law. They're evacuated right. to a, to a uh, hotel somewhere. Um, wow. And uh, really hoping that their place doesn't burn down. Um, Jeez, of course, man, that's rough. They're all right. It's just a bonkers time. It's just so crazy. It's so, it's one kid, one absolute insane like one huge life challenge after another in rapid succession and it's i'm just so tired of it man <laughs> i hear you drawing's hard enough <laughs> you yeah, know like you'd rather not be afraid for you know uh, <laughs> our, our our whole industry exists so far up maslow's hierarchy of needs you know what i mean like <laughs> it's uh It's hard to find the motivation to be like, oh, I think I will draw for fun while the sky is orange uh, in the middle of the day. It's like, oh. yeah. But I'm really glad we've been doing this. Lightbox has been such a, I was going to say breath of fresh air, but in the context, in the context <laughs> it's like, sounds too soon, too soon. Pun intended. Um, it really has been just to like rem rem remind myself, ourselves, that like we're part of a community. Yeah. Last year was really important to me that way. Like this year, 
it's not the same. They're they're doing great stuff with what they're able to do given the circumstances. But like last year was kind of life changing in a lot of ways for me. Like it was just it yeah. was um, one of those moments that was like, oh, this is I'm in I'm doing the right thing. This is cool. Like this is you have access to all these interesting people and I don't know, man. It just it hit me hard last year and I, I I'm sorry we don't have it again this year. But you know, there's always next year. We'll we'll make it work. Yeah, I think yeah under the circumstances you know, we're doing the best that's possible. Um, with it but it's uh i can't wait yeah next year i mean you were you were mobbed it was really cool to see uh our uh, for the people watching our, our our booths were like right next to each other i was there with procreate um as a as official ipad boy and max had his it was a pretty spectacular booth for like a con debut that was your first con right uh second second it was, my, okay. it was second. first it was my first solo one it was amazing. You had such a, a great like setup, and everyone was just excited about your work and the book that you just put out, and it's just great yeah. vibes coming off it the whole time. So, you can it definitely really see. Fun. Dude, I sold out of my books last year. I, yeah. I printed two hundred fifty, and I was like, oh man, I'm probably gonna come home with one hundred fifty of these if I'm lucky. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I sold out by lunchtime on on Sunday, and uh, oh, dang. and then I so then I printed a whole lot more, and I'm like, well, I'll do Lightbox again this year. And I'll put them online, and then like Lightbox, you know, got weird, and so like I've sold what like twenty books or something this oh, year. No. Oof. <laughs> it's fine, you know, it's it's all good. I get it, you know. It's, it's yeah. We're living in. I'm not gonna complain. Yeah. I'm I'm healthy. Everything's fine. That's why I went digital with the the book this year without waiting for, you know, yeah. a ton because it's like it just seems, like, you know, with the postal service being in such a weird space like i would rather True. get something in people's hands like as quickly as possible i mean that's what's great about br brushes right i mean like w they're great yeah. a they're so good and then b like <laughs> they're available immediately without any middleman uh kind of uh work in between yeah no difficulty no issues running into their things yeah By the way, everybody, you can buy Max's brushes at maxpacks.com. Uh, it's right up top in his banner. Um, I'm going to plug my thing, too, <laughs> since we're all here. Please do. Uh, I bought your book, by the way. Uh, you did? I did. Thank you. I haven't had a chance to look at that, but, I, you know. Um, Besides what you showed me What's that? Besides what you showed me personally. Yeah, yeah. It's It was a really fun project. It was kind of a labor of love, um, just trying to... Uh, corral like 10 years worth of work all together into one volume and and i didn't think i had enough uh but it turned out i really did have enough uh to sort of put together a, a proper book um so it exists digitally and it's at my gumroad page um if you're on twitch itself the link is right below uh the video that's playing right now um but if you are not and you're watching through the lightbox website then just go to gumroad uh, dot com forward slash Nicholas Call and you can grab yourself a copy, and oh, big ping! Uh, if you uh, use the code Lightbox at checkout, uh, that's five dollars off the deluxe edition. So uh, that's just today, and that will go away soon. So get them while they're high. What's that? Really good. It's an excellent book. Thanks, man. You should be proud of that. <laughs> Thanks, dude. It's 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 cool to step back after so long, you know, and to realize that you actually have something you know yeah. otherwise it's just a collection of jpegs that you're like i don't know yeah. <laughs> there's some stuff you know but putting together my book is a real experience like it's weird to filter out your old work and go like that's not good enough this is good i'm happy with this and it also makes you realize how in a lot of cases i was closer to my goal like earlier than i thought i was like there were mm. things happening that i was really proud of and i was like okay this is working but I didn't see it at the time because I knew how far I wanted to go and I wasn't there yet. But like a lot of the stuff made it into my book because I was proud of the way it came out. Um, where at the time I don't appreciate some of the stuff that I was building in every case. Yeah, it yeah, is. I think I'm oh. done with this guy. Please go ahead. Sorry. I think I'm done too. I'm throwing lightning bolts on this thing and I'm <laughs> really fully changing the uh, the piece probably for the worse at this point. So. I think, we I think probably... that's kind of cool because it helps acts, it helps like pull the eye towards the the imperiled characters. Maybe it just nice. defines the threat. Maybe like kind of what's what's yeah. scary about yeah. these? Oh, they're like fully electric. Um, yeah, because it's hard to paint bad breath. <laughs> no, so they're just these stink lines. Just 
<laughs> True. Oh, he's happy to abuse that. <laughs> Uh, let's take a look. Let's see, sort of see where, where we landed on uh, on old Big Cap. That looks good. Yeah, so um, you can always do more with water, but I would say these values are working for me pretty well. You can get much more careful with, with you know, the, the waves and stuff. I'm not going to get super into it, but I think in terms of defining a value structure, I think that's working pretty well. I'm pulling in the purples and the shadows because I think there was a little bit of that in the original. I think it's kind of nice. Um, I could have pushed it more teal but i think it's working and it feels a little bit in the sonic world kind of like charming um 16-bit color range which i like um so that's what i was sort of leaning into sort of like i've got sort of a triad i've got kind of like a uh an orange a purple and a green and i think that's charming and then i hit it with a little bit of red because bobbers are red but it's got a little bit of purple in it mm -hmm. um to help draw your eye to the focal point um but if you but really the, the big work that i did was the value range um was defining a light dark light side and dark side and just kind of not doing too like isolated of like little hot spot islands because i think there's just a, too much contrast per object and so it feels to me like it was shaded zoomed in like this without view of the whole piece mm -hmm. um which is very common like it's not a super harsh criticism i, I hope you understand but like if you look at the, the fishing rod you've got two really strong light sources that are of equal power. And if you look at mine, it's just one value, basically. And I think that works. I, like, I could have defined the stripes and stuff, and that's fine. But, like, I even I even had a rim light on it, and I killed it because it was just not helping. And so I think a lot of times you can just simplify, 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 um, and have a light side and a dark side, um, and let it be that, you know? So, like, I think there was just a, there's a lot of good stuff. There's, like, the perspective is super hard, and it's actually really well rendered with that perspective, with the volumes and stuff. That's true, really yeah, good. totally. Um, so like, there's, like, clear talent here, and I just want to make sure that we're seeing it a little better. Um, and also, I think things like this, like, making interesting light to dark transitions and thinking of your dark groupings and your light groupings is really important, and it's a great way to... Um, lift up your work and take it to the next level. So like this, there was like already kind of a nice crescent here um, in the eye or in, in, in the ear. So I just lean into that and let my, my shadow grouping accent that. Mm. Um, you can think all of these, you'll notice that like all of my, um, my splash, my, my waves are kind of value grouped more or less. And I put the highlight behind the bobber to help you point to what your character's looking at and kind of the whole point of the scene. And so like, and then there's this little guy just kind of um, put a little <laughs> highlight, cute. Uh, but it's a, you know, and then I also like put a little bit of purple into the lily pads and sort of like just made purples my my shadow color generally speaking. So there's a little bit of purple in the bobber um, with a little bit of like warm, kind of like lemony, you know, kind of orangey highlights. I guess. Um, I guess if I'm looking at it now, I'd probably want to take down the yellow. I might just take that a little bit more towards orange, just because that's I guess my preference, um, because it feels a little bit more like that's what would happen uh, in this lighting scenario. That just feels a little bit kind of like late afternoon. Um, so I'm going to just, like, this is so, so subtle, but I'm going to take it just a bit orange, because I think it'll just um, keep it in palette. And then just as a wrap-up, um, I might actually do a little bit of a shadow. Let me do that real fast. Um, I'm going to take that. Sorry, I can't help myself. <laughs> I know. Once you get started, it's really hard to to call it a day. Uh, it's night and day, though. Already, it's it's such a good uh, set of notes, man. Your paintovers are killer. Like you, you, <laughs> you perform really well under pressure with this stuff. So I'd love to to see more uh, in the future. I'm I sure everyone fun. else would too. And then as a finishing touch, that I did that little color grade thing at the end, which is nice. Uh, I do recommend painting with that off, by the way, because your sample colors will start to get polluted if you're not careful. Yes. Um, yeah. You can you can see what it did to the colors. This is a little bit raw. We talk about crayon box colors. This is a little bit raw. It's not much. It's not much. And this is like so so subtle. But you can see the, the the neutrals are just a little bit like dead neutral. And after this, it just it's a uh, has just a little bit of I don't know. It's got just a bit more personality. I don't know how else to put it. But it's just it feels a little bit more late afternoon. It feels a little bit more relaxing and kind of sweet. And it leans it into that sort of um, 16-bit color range again, I think. So, and, you know, as I look at this, I think I would maybe move some of these lily pads around a little bit because they're kind of right in the line of the, the fishing line. Um, 
So I just be a little bit more careful about where you're placing those, but it's not a big deal. It's like there's a they're kind of I wouldn't call them distracting, but I don't know if they're helping you mm. there. But it's nice to have something from this perspective. So, mm. um, you know, I, you know, it's funny as I look at this. I know I extended the sky a little bit. I might zoom it in, just crop off the top slightly. But you know, I think it's improved because everything is not quite so crowded. But you, you get the idea. So just just watch your uh, composition because, like, again, right here, you're you're kind of hitting the edge of the, of the picture plane. Mm. So. Tangents there as well. So just you know, watch town, watch tangents. No big deal. It's a good piece though. Really nice. Like well drawn, well observed. You know, that's a hard, hard perspective to get, especially with the hands and everything. It's, it's really good. So hopefully that helps. Mm. Way <laughs> well done. Um, and I think I've talked this pretty pretty thoroughly through, but just in case, um, I'll just really quick pass obviously you know for everybody this is a blanket statement the pieces you guys sent in as a submit submissions were so good and uh showed like so much strong structure underneath um and like i said it was really hard to like pick stuff that you could meaningfully change because there's such good fundamentals underneath there so i hope that this was informative um in this case uh you know the the flat color stuff underneath is so strong it's actually really good material for paint overs to have like a really strong mm -hmm. graphic underpinning to sort of work up from. Um, and uh, the structure, it's all there. You know, it's all present. I think the actually the biggest color compositional change was repositioning the brightest and most saturated red. Um, and then the, the second thing that was sort of most important, you know, uh, it was hazing back the creature, the serpent, so that you get that sense of scale. Um, and then really everything else is just kind of driving focus to the creature's face, to the imperiled uh, plinth standers, uh, the main characters there, wrapping them around with foreground elements to feel more threatened and more surrounded, uh, smaller elements to sell scale, um, and just kind of working some of that teal, the cool kind of highlight uh, in the center of the frame through everything, just to really lock you in with those characters and in that space. Uh, but uh, awesome work. And... I had a lot of fun. Yeah, this is good. I, I appreciate you guys for sticking through all the technical difficulties. Um, but yeah, I, thanks, guys. I think uh, I think it was worth it in the end. Um, so uh, with that, I know we have definitely passed the two and a half hour mark, um, and I think we can call it there. How do you think, Max? I think it's good. If, if any of the original artists want to reach out to me for uh, specific questions about choices I made or anything like that, I'll be happy to answer questions too. Absolutely. Yeah, likewise, um, if there's uh, artists, uh, specifically the people whose stuff uh, was painted over on the stream and you have questions or you want to see the files or uh, by all means, uh, I have my Twitter DMs are open. Um, so it goes both ways. Max, just thank you so much for taking the time and for battling through. Yeah, this is a blast. The... We should do this again. This is fun. We'll figure out our technical issues. Next I would time. really like to. I, I, I really enjoyed this. I'm, I'm huge, obviously a huge fan of your work, so I'm very flattered that you would uh, take the time at all. So I really appreciate it. No, it was a blast. Yeah, thanks. Awesome, man. All right, well, uh, that's it for my Lightbox weekend. Um, thank you guys so much for all your time and attention. Uh, all my social media stuff and all of Max's uh, main stuff are up on screen for you to track us elsewhere when the weekend wraps up. Um, uh, but uh, have an amazing time. Uh, go check out the other panels. Um, uh, can I raid anybody? Anybody around where we can send everybody to? I'm going to be doing an Instagram live in a few minutes just for a quick Q&A to wrap up the, the weekend for myself. So if anybody wants to join or talk about whatever, you're more than welcome Amazing. Okay, cool. Wait. Oh, it sounds like Zedig. Oh, yeah, that would be perfect. Let's do, uh, let's raid Zedig's channel with these guys. Uh, so I'm going to send uh, everybody over to Zedig's channel because he's streaming and he's incredible. Um, absolute art idol of mine. And uh, uh, those of you uh, who are ready to head off, uh, head over immediately to Maxi Lickney's Instagram Live. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it, man. Heck yeah. Thanks, dude. All right. Bye. See you guys.